Welcome to CN Live in Alexandria, Virginia, across the river from Washington, D.C. I'm Joe Loria, Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News. And I'm Elizabeth Voss in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And now the headlines. A hearing has been cancelled to appeal WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange's 50-week sentence imposed on Assange for skipping bail. Meanwhile, CNN published what can only be called a hit piece against Assange, pretending to have an exclusive proving he set up the Ecuador embassy in London as a, quote, command center to disrupt the 2016 U.S. presidential election. El Pais in Spain already had the same files for a week and didn't come to the same conclusions, such as CNN saying, quote, Assange met with Russians and world class hackers at critical moments frequently for hours at a time. He also acquired powerful new computing and network hardware to facilitate data transfers just weeks before WikiLeaks received hacked materials from Russian operatives, end quote. Former Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa also called the report rubbish. However, he did accuse WikiLeaks of having favored Donald Trump in the election. To discuss these developments, we'll be joined from Reykjavik, Iceland by Kristen Hafrinson, editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, right after the headlines. DNC staffers Seth Rich was murdered on a Washington, D.C. street three years ago last Saturday. On the third anniversary of his killing, Yahoo News published a major investigation by journalist Michael Isakoff that posits that Russia was behind the conspiracy theory that Rich was killed by the DNC for having leaked its emails to WikiLeaks. Isakoff will be joining us later in the program to discuss his findings. Russia has intensified its airstrikes against jihadist positions in Syria's Idlib province, the last major stronghold of violent opposition to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Meanwhile, tensions remain high between Iran and the United States and its Gulf Arab allies weeks after Donald Trump came within minutes of setting off a potentially catastrophic war in the Gulf. The Emir of Qatar left Washington last week after a four-day visit and apparently was unable to convince the U.S. to allow Qatar to act as a mediator between the U.S. and Iran. We'll be discussing this and other regional issues later in the program with Assad Abu Khalil, a professor of political science at California State University. Yesterday, the Wall Street Journal reported, quote, when Brazil celebrated corruption fighting judge agreed to become President Jair Bolsonaro's justice minister, he lent credibility to uh, a leader who had courted controversy. Eight months later, Sergio Moro is now himself the center of controversy. Over the past month, The Intercept website in Brazil has published leaked text messages showing what it says is Mr. Moro then working as a judge, secretly coordinating with prosecutors to convict former President Luiz Inácio de Lula da Silva in 2017. While Mr. Moro appears to be weathering the scandal, his critics say it threatens something more important than his career, 
the credibility of Brazil's justice system and car wash, Latin America's largest anti-graft investigation. That's the Wall Street <clears throat> Journal. Joining us later in the program today will be veteran Brazilian journalist Pepe Escobar for his insights into the scandal rocking Brazil. We turn now to Kristen Halpernson, editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, who joins us from Reykjavik, Iceland. Kristen, welcome to CN Live. Thanks for having me. So first, we're going to just, uh, you know, address the latest news that we have. So can you tell us, explain why the hearing uh, was canceled regarding Assange's appeal of the bail sentence that he has been, that has been handed down for 50 weeks? Well, it doesn't come as a, as a surprise. Uh, this uh, was, uh, has been delivered for quite a while. Uh, Julian and the lawyers came to the conclusion that uh, the benefit of actually uh, trying to fight this would be minimal, even if, if it would be won. Uh, it will take time uh, and it will take resources and focus uh, from the, the big issue, which is uh, fighting the extradition. And uh, he would, uh, even if he would win the, uh, the, this case in the appeal, he would still be held in remand. Uh, there's an opportunity in October after 25 weeks of the 50 to, uh, to get into better conditions out of Belmar's prison. So uh, it, uh, it, it would be... A, basically a, a waste of resources under the circumstances. So uh, the, uh, it doesn't come as a surprise. I knew that uh, for quite a while that would be the case. But it doesn't take the focus from the fact that this is a, uh, an outrageous uh, sentence uh, for a, a minor conviction under UK law, which usually is settled with a fine or a, uh, a small sentence. Uh, and uh, it, uh, the, the damage which is uh, uh, huge though, because uh, he is placed under circumstances where, uh, where it uh, it is impossible for him to uh, properly prepare prepare for the uh, defense in against the extradition uh, request, uh, which is due in in court in late February. Absolutely. So, speaking of of uh, his preparation for that defense, um, what access to Julian Assange um, are his lawyers able to have? Is are they able to get? proper access to him now and uh, if we can ask how is his health because we haven't heard a lot uh, since the reports that he was uh, transferred to the uh, medical ward of Belmarsh prison. He's still in the medical ward but I saw him uh, a couple of weeks ago in, when I was in London. Uh, he has, uh, he has, uh, has stabilized somewhat so he's in a better condition than before. Uh, it is not ideal uh, but uh, I hope it will improve. Um, Concerning the lawyers, they have uh, uh, increased access now to him. It's, it's, it's getting better. Uh, so uh, it, there was a, there was a, it, it took, a, t took a while to get the, the, uh, the communication between the lawyers and him in the prison into a uh, proper, uh, proper manner for everything to con continue in, in, the, the, in the preparation. But the... Uh, the worst thing is that he does not himself have access to uh, a computer, uh, the internet, uh, and uh, he's not aware of, of, of the, what is going on in the world, uh, which is uh, an important factor in preparing for the, uh, the extradition hearing. You can see all the, the bias that is going on in the media and, and, and around him, and he is, he is constantly asking for those information, but it's hard to, uh, to uh, to get that information to him so he can you know, fathom what, uh, what, what he's up against in, in reality. Absolutely. Do you have any comment on the video that we saw a number of weeks ago that was leaked from Belmarsh Prison? Uh, you know, there was a lot of confusion about what the source could have been, what, you know, what to make of that video. Do you have any comment on that at all? Well, not really. I'm, I'm, I'm not really uh, quite clear on, on what it was all about, whether it was uh, a guard or another inmate with a, a contraband phone or what the person's intentions were in reality. So I was a bit skeptical and, uh, um, and uh, it doesn't seem that Julian was aware of, of this. Um, whether it was just a, an attempt to, to get uh, some extra cash or whether it was actually genuinely a, 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 an approach to support him in some manner, I'm not sure. But uh, you know, that's all I can say about it because I don't know the details. And uh, if it was a contraband phone, I'm pretty certain that everything has been turned upside down and it has been confiscated. Uh, Chris and Mr. Loria here in outside Washington. Thanks for joining us. Let's turn to that CNN story for a minute. 
it's oh, yeah. um, it, um, and either it's laziness on the part of journalists or some intentional attempt to smear uh, Julian Assange. The documents that and surveillance videos they refer to uh, have already been published or were in the acts uh, in the possession rather of El Pais weeks ago. So the idea that it's an exclusive is really not true. But Correa, former President Correa, has condemned it. Uh, as rubbish, but he also does say that WikiLeaks favored Clinton. And there's a lot of intelligent people I know, some of them friends here in Washington and elsewhere, who believe the same thing. Now, I want to ask you, there's no evidence. In order to make a statement like that, you need evidence that WikiLeaks had emails or other damaging information about Trump and suppress them and refused to publish them. Is it true? Did WikiLeaks at any time have anything on Trump that they withheld in order to help Clinton and help Trump? No, of course they didn't. Of course, WikiLeaks didn't. And I mean, I could, I could talk at length about that uh, that CNN uh, story, which is amazing in many respects. I mean, the the thing that you point out uh, correctly is that this is not an exclusive at all. This has been this is recycled material that's been uh, published in uh, the Spanish media for months uh, now, and uh, there's nothing new in this. Um, uh, an attempt is made to create. Uh, um, uh, uh, a new flavor of it with, with, by combining into a timeline and, and, and connecting together some uh, unconnected events, uh, which is not scientific at all and it's not journalism at all. This is uh, not fact-based. This is a lot of innuendo and uh, uh, really just uh, poor journalism. And uh, one has to uh, question what the agenda is. Uh, you know, I was spectacled from the very outset uh, when I got an email from CNN asking me to comment on the, their upcoming story, which I never did, by the way. Uh, I saw no need for that because um, there was so much uh, uh, wrongful factual information in the emails. And, uh, and uh, funnily enough, uh, they addressed me as uh, Mrs. Shrapson, which I thought did not improve my belief in their quality of the journalism. They couldn't even get my gender right. Uh, they didn't get the right the name of, uh, of my colleagues who were working with Julian. Uh, they uh, called them collaborators, which is one sort of uh, indication of their bias. And those collaborators uh, were uh, um, said to have, have been moving evidence out of the embassy and i thought evidence of what i mean are we talking about a crime here what is the insinuation there i mean is it evidence of committing the crime of journalism which of course cnn would never be uh, accused of in latter days uh so and on and on i mean they they talked about uh, uh, hackers two hackers who had frequently visited julian and i it, it really uh, bothered me because we were, we were talking about the two individuals there which are respected computer experts in Germany. Uh, they are part of uh, the Bau Holland Foundation and the uh, Chaos Com Computer Club. They have, uh, they have contributed to lawmaking in the Bundestag. Uh, they are experts in, they are computer experts and especially in, in privacy on the internet and such matters and they are respected. And the Bau Holland Foundation, which is known of course to be have have uh, worked with WikiLeaks. They have managed uh, some of our finances for uh, more than a decade. Uh, they are a registered charity under very strict uh, supervision by uh, German authorities. So somehow labeling them hackers in the negative terms, I thought, I thought was derogatory, and uh, and showed the, the 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 approach that CNN was taking. And there was a lot there. I mean, the talk of Russians coming. I mean. For heaven's sake, I mean, we're talking about, you know, getting flashbacks to the 50s, to neo to McCarthyism. Uh, a Russian enters uh, uh, an embassy and has a meeting, thereby, you know, there has to be a conspiracy or a collusion. So it was pathetic, you know, yeah. in its entirety, that report, and uh, really shameful. And I I thought actually that this... Uh, um, this narrative had been uh, set to rest by the Mueller report, which was a blow to the uh, Russia Gators uh, when it came out. But uh, now it's being revisited. They're trying to to sort of uh, uh, blow into the ashes to kindle that flame again. But all they are really getting is ashes in their face because it's there's nothing there. In fact, uh, Kristen, you're absolutely right that this seems yeah. to be the attempt to keep 
the Mueller uh, investigation alive long after he concluded there was no collusion. That was a big disappointment to outlets like CNN and those who, who believed in that narrative. Uh, but when you read the story, it looks like uh, he's conducting journalism and somehow they're constructing this into something nefarious. The Russian, one of the Russians who visited him was the producer of his show that he had on RT uh, around uh, 2012. So that's a Russian uh, producer visiting a man who's doing a show for yeah. them. But I, I wanted to ask you now about the source of the, the, the emails, the DNC and the Podesta emails. First of all, uh, I know you can't tell us if you know who the source mm -hmm. is, but uh, can you say with certainty that it was a leak and not a hack? And second of all, does it really matter who the source was? If a source is making an oral statement to a reporter, you need definitely to get another one or two sources to verify, and you have to look into the motive of that source. But when it's documents that can be verified, in my opinion, as 30 years in this business, even if the devil came out of hell himself and handed me documents, uh, uh, whatever his motive is, if I can verify them, then I'm going to run with that. I'm going to publish it. But of course, an oral statement's different. So please tell us what you can. Do you know who the source is but can't tell us? And does it matter uh, who the source is? Uh, and thirdly, was it a leak and not a hack? Can you say that definitively? No, I mean, um, uh, I'm going to be very careful there for obvious reasons, but I, it doesn't really matter. You're, you're, you're totally correct there. And this is uh, what I've been trying to, uh, to, to place emphasis on. And I've, I even said, you know, uh, I, you know, in some interviews that even if uh, Satan himself would give me documents about corruption in the kingdom of heaven, I would, be, uh, I would have to publish it as a journalist. It's my journalistic duty. It doesn't matter where it comes from. If it's truthful... And if it's in the public interest to publish it, you cannot suppress it. You have a duty to publish it. That's the, the core matter here. It's journalism. If you don't get that, you should get out of that business right away and carry out, empty your desk and take it out of the CNN office, whatever offer it is, you know, get rid of the evidence of your inca you know, incapacity to actually fathom what journalism is about. So I'm, I'm, I, I get a bit angry when I... When I uh, when I get into this matter, it's just, it, it is straightforward to me. I mean, this is, journalists are supposed to uh, expose material on candidates and on parties, on political entities, especially right before the election. That's where their priority is to influence the voters. So they have a duty. I mean, it's their sacred duty. That's why they have a special privileges and position in society. That's why we call, you know, somehow loftily uh, the, about the fourth estate. So, that exactly, this is, this is exactly what WikiLeaks did. And uh, where the information comes from is absolutely secondary. It doesn't really matter. Uh, Julian has self, himself has said publicly that this was a, a not Russian, not a state actor. And uh, let's stick to that. What, was it a leak, uh, not a hack? Can you comment on that? How the uh, emails were obtained? No, I mean, the... the Wikileaks obtained this information and got the information uh, and published it. That's the end of the story. And, you know, I just want to raise some, you know, issue here which, which might be of interest. Uh, there is a possibility, and also, I'm not saying it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a fact in this case, but it's often in many other cases where information actually comes from, uh, come from more than one source. And that, that is a scenario that was totally left out on the uh, out in the Mueller report and in most reporting about uh, 2016. So the, that is something to be to keep in mind when people are criticizing or or, or you know uh, evaluating the scenario there. Uh, you talk about Rafael Correa, and I have respect for Correa for, for many things. He's done very good things, but uh, he's not a journalist. He doesn't understand the, the core values of journalism that I just uh, was emphasizing earlier. Uh, it's not a question of whether you have to wait to have a balanced information on, on two parties or all parties before you publish anything. That's not how it works. Uh, that's like, uh, you know, demanding that those who had uh, the access Hollywood tape, uh, where Trump was talking, you know, in his manner that everybody knows of about women, uh, should not have been published unless the, that media organization would have something, has something on, on, on Clinton. It just doesn't make sense. That's not how it works. It's the entirety of, of journalism working together 
they publish what they have and uh, they do their best to inform for, uh, inform the electorate mm. and uh, one one thing which is, might be might be uh, uh, actually on on Rafael Correa's mind in that context is a uh, very it's, a, it's 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 often cited actually in the, the context of uh, the Podesta emails and the Access Hollywood uh, uh, video that was published. Uh, it is often claimed that uh, WikiLeaks published within an hour after the Access Hollywood tape the Podesta emails to try to uh, influence the perception of the or you know uh, brush over the uh, the uh, Access Hollywood tape. Now, this is in the Mueller report. This is what Hillary Clinton has claimed. This is what the DNC people have claimed and all the liberal media in the U.S. Uh, there is a proof that this is not the case because this was published in collaboration with mainstream media. And one journalist has stepped forward and said, this is wrong because I was working on this material and the date and time was set, you know, 24 hours prior to the publication of the Podesta material. So it wasn't just, you know, rushing through and clicking a button and put something online. It was something that was, was, was prepared and the time was set. This is how it works when we work with uh, um, uh, other media on publishing our material. And uh, in this case, the journalist uh, from La Repubblica in Italy, a very respected journalist, uh, Stefania Morici, has gone, you know, on, on record saying, you know, this was not just a, a rush decision because I knew exactly the day before the hour and the, uh, when it should be published because we had to coordinate. Okay. Nobody has, want, wants to listen to this very, very important evidence of uh, the fact that this was not um, some kind of an attempt to overshadow the Access Hollywood tape. Now, the interesting thing is when you have actually uh, stricken that of the table, uh, there is a big question remaining. Was this a huge coincidence that these very important material on, on Trump and the Clintons was published within an hour? As an investigative journalist, I, 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 I always get spe uh, very skeptical when it comes to uh, claims of coincidences. So could it be the other way around that actually there was a uh, uh, a knowledge that Wikileaks was just about to publish this, and uh, the Access Hollywood tape was published as a reaction by front running it an hour before. It's an interesting question. I'm not claiming it's the case, but it certainly is an interesting question to look into. And uh, but no journalist yet wants to go there because it might actually reveal some uncomfortable truth. In fact, Stefania Marizzi wrote that in Consortium News in that article that she worked on the Trump documents. And she also said that the you, uh, WikiLeaks had received some material on Trump, were working on it, and then discovered it had already been published, so they couldn't use it. Thirdly, or secondly, um, in the film Risk, you hear uh, Julian Assange say on the phone that we just received some interesting emails on Hillary Clinton. Unfortunately, we don't have anything on Trump yet, so it seemed like he wanted to get something, and couldn't. And I might add that Trump was an open book to those who say that only dirt on Clinton was revealed. He, he was out there uh, saying most outrageous things. We knew what kind of a person he was, the homophobe, the, uh, uh, the misogynist, and the racist that he uh, as turned out to be was becoming clear during his campaign. So one hardly needed, whereas Clinton was a typical politician who was hiding uh, most of this stuff. I'd like to just move to quickly to the issue of the Espionage Act, uh, Kristen, because uh, in researching it, I first discovered that the Espionage Act is based on the 1907 U.S. Defense Secrets Act, which is based on the 1888 British Official Secrets Act. So even Daniel Ellsberger said we don't have an Official Secrets Act in the U.S., but in fact, our espion the provenance of the Espionage Act is the British Official Secrets Act. And until now, there had been only two presidents who tried to prosecute reporters for Section E of that act, which is possession, dissemination, classified information. There had been earlier prosecutions around the First World War when the act was passed about uh, impeding the draft. But on Section E, which is purely about holding, uh, possessing, unauthorized possession of classified information publication, uh, FDR tried uh, and dropped a case during the war, and uh, Nixon tried to prosecute two New York Times reporters during the Pentagon Papers mm -hmm. case, but and even a pound of grand jury in Boston, and that failed. Donald Trump's defers to prosecute a journalist that happens to be 
Julian Assange, and we even saw the journalists who had opposed him so vociferously, including Rachel Maddow, suddenly realizing this could be us next and how dangerous this is. Could you just comment on what the historic significance is of the prosecution of Julian Assange under the Espionage Act? I mean, it's it's of uh, it cannot be underestimated how much significance it has. It, it's it's basically it would be a turning point uh, for the for the future of journalism in this century if this would not be opposed. I mean, this is uh, uh, that's why it's so important that that uh, he is not extradited. Uh, journalists are yes, you even mentioned Rachel Maddow and uh, others have actually even seen the light there, which is about time, and how, how dangerous this is. We're getting into such danger, dangerous territory that uh, we're attacking the basic foundation of, of, uh, uh, of, of journalism. And uh, journalists are more and more seeing it. I was in Tunisia just uh, a month ago at the Inter Congress of the International Federation of Journalists, where anonymously all the uh, the uh, the uh, unions that came together from all, all around the world uh, uh, adopted a resolution condemning this uh, resolution uh, placed forth by the uh, uh, Australian uh, Journalist Federation, supported by the French and the Tunisians. And uh, I could see there and sense there that uh, there, there there was alarm. I mean, they are, people are alarmed because they see how dangerous red line this is to cross. But this is not has not just. Uh, uh, it's not a certain thing, and uh, I, I just cannot uh, leave uh, uh, Obama out of uh, out, out of the progress towards this, because of course he was the, the president and his administration that start uh, over extending the Espionage Act to, to whistleblowers, uh, which was a, a worrying sign, uh, and is, is a stain on his legacy as a president. Uh, so he set the scene, and we always said throughout the years in his presidency that. Journalists will be next. First, they will go after whistleblowers with the Espionage Act, but the journalists will be next. Julian Assange now is the first, but if this goes uh, unprotested, if this goes through, he will most certainly not be the last. Uh, before I turn it over to Elizabeth, one other question. Uh, just a few days after the arrest of Assange and indictment under the Act, we saw the federal police in Australia raid the headquarters of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation to look for documents that they copied about a story that revealed potential war crimes by Australian for special forces in Australia. We saw an arrest of journalists in France. Do you think that th this has been the floodgates opening because of the indictment of Assange, that other governments that always look around the world to what the U.S. does will feel more comfortable going after their own journalists now? Absolutely. There's no question about it. And I've talked to Australian journalists that agreed to that, even though they don't do it publicly, that there's a clear connection there. Uh, this is... Uh, when you... When you when you when you start with the, I mean, the, the uh, you, you normalize uh, uh, something of that nature and everybody goes uh, and and and, and uh, copies it around the world, uh, that is just uh, uh, there is no no question about the the connection there, and it shows how how, how terribly uh, worrying this is for the future of journalism. And if we if we take away this 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 uh, this element of, of journalism, you are basically. Uh, striking such a blow to democracy that uh, uh, you would have to question uh, the validity of calling nations democratic. And we were talking about such an important element here to uh, expose war crimes and uh, government corruption. If you take that away and you call it espionage and, uh, and threaten journalists with the death penalty at maximum, uh, that, is, that is the end of... Uh, of our privileged position in the Western country of having a, a, a f the free press. Um, I, I'm, I painted in such serious uh, uh, colors because that's the truth. Indeed, the Espionage Act indictment, if you read it, just describes investigative journalism. The founder of our website, Robert Perry, said that he often encouraged his sources to commit a crime if necessary, to reveal mm -hmm. information that would expose a larger crime, such as potential war crimes. So the indictment describes journals and protecting a source and encouraging them to give information. Elizabeth. Absolutely. I'd like to return to 2016 just to ask um, about the fact that we know that Assange said in June of 2016 that WikiLeaks had had uh, Clinton emails in its possession. But we see in the Mueller report that uh, which 
claims that in July, Goose for Two and DC leaks, which the Mueller report also claims are Russian fronts for the GRU, sent uh, the documents as a file through an intermediary. So can you just talk for a moment about, about that contradiction and what that says about the Mueller report in a larger sense? Well, I've, I've been hesitant in talking about the Mueller report uh, because I haven't seen the Mueller report. Uh, the, the document is, is so, so, so heavily redacted that it's hard to read uh, to actually make, make a full assessment of it. So, but but uh, um, there are uh, inconsistencies there which, uh, uh, which, which weakens uh, the re report dramatically. Uh, I mentioned one actually, which was concerning the publication of, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the Podesta emails and the timing of it. There, is, there are others, as you point out, and uh, uh, I'm sure in, full, in, in, in due course we will get the full access and you can actually digest and to dissect the, it in entirety. But I mean, the, the end, end of the day, this was a, a, such a um, blow to the, uh, the Russiagators uh, that uh, it was almost uh, uh, comical to watch how uh, the liberal media uh, tried to, to fathom the uh, betrayal of, of Mueller. And I, uh, I, wonder, I wonder if, uh, if uh, the next step will be to undermine him, actually, which would be a, a ridiculous turnaround from the time when uh, there was such a belief in him that he would always, was almost held as a, as a saint in, in, uh, in liberal circles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Joe. Yes. Well, uh, we wanted to thank you for joining us. I just wanted to add um, on that Hollywood access issue. I believe, if I'm not wrong, that NBC was criticized for holding on to that for weeks, if not a year before they actually published it. So they also were suppressing that until the, op the optimum moment for the election. So, but uh, that's conveniently forgotten. And WikiLeaks is again, you know, seem to be holding the bag here and, and criticized. And the CNN report uh, is clearly quite an, an extraordinary development in, in looking at the fact that there is no collusion. That story should be dying. Uh, my personal view is, Kristen, that there are a bunch of journalists, Luke Harding being among amongst them, uh, maybe a chief amongst them, who actually wrote a book called Collusion, and it hit the New York Times bestseller list. And as no evidence was emerging to support that, he got desperate, in my opinion, and bought that story that Manafort had entered the embassy to visit Assange. And now, with all these tapes having been revealed from the Spanish and, and before that, there's no evidence that Manafort visited. And I wonder if that's not what we see here again in CNN, that they, they went out on such a limb that they got to save their own reputations. So they will double down on the story and take what is obviously an act of journalism by Assange and turn it into mm -hmm. a story with a lot of potentials and possibly this and that Russians delivering documents in a bag. How can we know what was in that bag? That kind of thing. You think that there's a kind of desperation on the part of journalists who, who clearly got it wrong, can admit their mistake and are doubling down. Of course it is. Luke, Luke Harding is a prime example of that. I mean, the man who uh, uh, tried to make money out of the collusion uh, uh, illusion and, and did by selling books. Uh, and uh, he, he looks bad now when, uh, and, uh, when they, even his own paper had to admit that, uh, that there was no collusion find, found. <clears throat> so, uh, and uh, the, the story that you mentioned from November 27th, we have not forgotten that. We have a year to uh, file a libel case against uh, uh, The Guardian and Luke Harding, and we are actually still preparing that, and it's not forgotten. Uh, it's an important thing because it was such a damaging uh, story, a total fabrication put on the front page when, when The uh, Guardian just doesn't uh, uh, want to admit uh, that they were wrong and they have... Uh, not been able to defend that story publicly even. Uh, so um, we'll see more of that later. But uh, overall, I wonder what the, the, uh, the underlying uh, issue is here. Because if, uh, if the liberal media and the CNN with the, the story, and I, I know of other stories of similar nature that are brewing, and, uh, and I'm a bit surprised that three years after the election, one year until the next election, there should be still this uh, 
uh, emphasis on on uh, revisiting the past instead of focusing on the future how will it benefit the the, the democratic party to uh, to go after the story and try to keep it alive i don't see the connection there i don't think it i think it will benefit uh, um, the uh, the democratic candidate whoever uh, he or she will be so i'm wondering what whether there is more uh, uh, sinister thing behind it and actually whether this is an indirect uh, attempt to uh, to make it easier to uh, to uh, to stop to uh, fa to facilitate actually the extradition of Julian Assange to the United States to undermine its credibility uh, uh, and continue on that track so whether this is a part of that uh, strategy in the in the upcoming extradition proceedings uh, rather than actually trying to clear some new truths about uh, what happened three years ago uh, with CNN and has totally failed and uh, it's hard to see how it benefits the Democratic Party, actually. Well, you could look at Russiagate, and I do, in the context of U.S. establishment trying to get uh, to undermine and weaken the Putin government because it has stood up to the United States, where they had Yeltsin during the 1990s, who opened the door to Wall Street to make alliances with oligarchs, asset stripped the country. Putin has stood up and defended Russian interests, whatever we think of him. And that is unacceptable to the U.S. establishment and their interests there. So creating the Russiagate story that Russia was trying to interfere in U.S. democracy was, it was and still is an important part of that vilification of Russia to weaken them. And it also hurts WikiLeaks, which of course, let's face it, has been doing the job the mainstream media has largely failed to do, to hold leaders to account, to uncover uh, prima facie evidence of war crimes, corruption of governments around the world, principally the U.S., and they, they've got to be stopped. So Russiagate in one uh, stone he'll, kills two birds for them. Russia and WikiLeaks. And uh, so the failure of that, of Mueller, who was a hitman, let's face it, for the establishment, and he failed to find the clues. He tried like hell when he couldn't do it. It's a big blow to them. Uh, do you think they're going to drop this in the 20s? Is that what you were saying? That they, they are going to drop it in the 2020 election? Because the American people don't give a damn about Russia. Okay? Polls show they care about health care. They care about uh, feeding their families. The basic economic issue is the middle class has been devastated here by 30 years of neoliberal policies. They don't care about Russia. Okay? Why will they go to that again? Do you think that they will, this? Well, I'm, I'm not sure about it. I'm not such an expert on, on, on the U.S. politics, but uh, I wonder if, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if uh, this emphasis will actually contribute to uh, uh, their possible loss in the election next year, which would be a rather a, 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 an extraordinary thing. It would almost be like Hillary Clinton losing twice, uh, one being a candidate and again not being a candidate, you know, four years later. Uh, so this is uh, this is the context where I see it. With um, I think I, I I see it now in the uh, in the in the context of uh, of, of undermining uh, Julian and uh, and make it easier for the uh, the British establishment to extradite him, and, uh, and that is what the uh, contributes to what uh, Niels Melcher, the special rapporteur on torture, actually did uh, highlight in uh, his preliminary report. The, the full report is due to. Uh, to be published next week, uh, when he talked about the uh, the uh, that he had never in 20 years in his his service as, as in his expertise seen such uh, a blatant uh, uh, well a coalition of four democratic nations uh, coming together in a public mobbing of an individual and all I mean every every aspect of of government you know in the judiciary uh, and the media. Uh, going after an individual in the manner they have against Julian Assange is quite extraordinary and it hasn't stopped and this is what we're up against in the fight uh, to stop the extradition to the United States and it's an uphill battle for sure and it will be a tough one uh, but uh, we still hope that enough people will uh, come around and decide to be on the right side of history. Do you think it matters who the next prime minister will be whether Hunter Johnson terms of the, far the home minister that he appoints in the extradition? Well, I'm not so sure about it. We actually know where we have have uh, Hunt for sure. I mean, he has he has he has come out very, you know, uh, unconditionally that he welcomed uh, the arrest of Julian Assange and uh, told actually American media the day before Trump visited London that uh, he would in no manner stand in the way of extraditing him. So we know we have him. Uh, Boris Johnson is a is a. Um, 
is a, is a <laughs> figure that is hard to uh, to uh, understand in which direction he will go. But uh, they are both conservatives, and uh, uh, we're not too optimistic about either of those individuals. Yeah. Well, maybe Johnson will get up on the wrong side of the bed one day and say, "Let him, let him go." We don't yeah, want him. <laughs> we, we, we never know. I mean, he is it's, it's <laughs> unpredictable. Hard. A very unpredictable individual, but uh, at least Jeremy Hunt is. Uh, uh, we know we know what kind of person he is and uh, where he stands on the issue. Krista, before we let you go, in your London press conference and the day before, I believe Julian was arrested, you mentioned uh, about the surveillance, the extortion attempt against WikiLeaks, that you were working to find out how those tapes got from either the Ecuadorian government or the Spanish contractor into the hands of these criminals. Can you? Share, uh, shed any light on that question right now? No, of course, but I think it's, uh, it has been now fairly well established that uh, the, uh, the uh, security companies uh, who were working in the Ecuadorian embassy have been uh, uh, disseminating this information uh, in some manner. It, at least they have uh, lost control of it because that's been uh, you know, pushed around in the media and in, uh, in CNN uh, latest. Uh, we always suspected the, uh, the uh, security companies to uh, not be too reliable. And I always thought it was extraordinary that a, a, <clears throat> a sovereign nation would, would hire a security company from a third country to actually oversee their security in a, in a diplomatic uh, compound. And they were not pr professional. The individuals there, some of them were hostile from the outset. There were some confrontations with them, uh, as is reported, uh, it's truth. Uh, even though, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, spirit was pretty good to, between Julia and the staff and the diplomatic staff in the embassy. Uh, so it is actually for the Spanish police to find out and they are investigating. It's part of the uh, uh, ongoing investigation uh, and charges against the extortionists, uh, how they got their hands on the material and where it actually came from. Well, thank you, Chris and Elizabeth. Thank you so much. I really Thanks appreciate you joining us. Thank you. All the best to you. So Elizabeth, um, we're very fortunate to have Kristen with us. And uh, we can go now to a musical interlude, I think, when we're waiting for our next guest to come. And that will be uh, Asad Abu Khalil. He'll be talking about the Middle East when we come back and just a few moments. We're welcoming George Samueli from uh, Budapest, Hungary. George, welcome. You heard the interview with Kristen. Yep. Tell us uh, your, yes. impression, your impressions. Well, I, th I think um, he does seem to be quite pessimistic, and I think rightly about the uh, situation. Um, I think um, the CNN story uh, it reflects the very... Um, bad situation that Julian is in right now because there really hasn't been any great shift in media opinion toward him. I mean, I think it's very significant that on the eve of Mahler's testimony on the Hill, 
uh, CNN should regurgitate all of the accusations. I mean, really, with no originality whatsoever, all of the accusations about uh, Julian Assange, uh, Russia, uh, WikiLeaks, um, you know, the, how they fixed the 2016 election, the whole thing, the whole thing. There's CNN putting it out. And I think that's very significant that that's the way CNN is choosing to play it. So instead of any kind, expressing any kind of sympathy for Julian Assange, instead of seeing him as the persecuted journalist, this is one week after the big uh, media freedom conference in London. So instead of expressing any sympathy at all for him, it just uh, essentially regurgitates all of the um, attacks on him. And I think there's going to be more and more of this. Um, and I think that uh, Kristen... Uh, seem to be alluding to that, that that's, a, that's, a, that, that's really where we are now, that there, there really isn't the kind of um, support for Julian um, in the mainstream media that um, uh, we might have expected. So you think that concern that was expressed right after the Espionage Act uh, indictment by Maddow and others was very short-lived then? That yes. They they, yeah, they were worried for a day or two, and now they don't give it. And you did exactly. say that at the time, if I believe you did I did say, say that. that at the time. And I think that um, the the deafening silence, I mean, since then, and this has now been, what, about, you know, about two months, I think, since the, 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 the second indictment was issued. So there's been really no talk uh, in, in the media about this. Um, and last week, when there was that big uh, conference in London, and um, Amal Clooney, you know, somewhat, disingenuously brought up the indictment of Julian Assange. This was barely mentioned in the uh, mainstream media. I, th I don't think it in fact was mentioned in the media at all. Um, uh, so, so there was even none of that. And even when she brought that uh, subject up at, at the, uh, the conference, there was no applause. There was no, there were no cheers. There was nothing. I mean, you know, Hunt, Hunt just continued looking at his notes and that was it. The, the, Meanwhile, the moment came was... and went. Mom, meanwhile, RT was barred from entry, which, you know, was exactly the critical yeah. that, they, that, that, that's they right. may have given us the close up of Hunt's face while she was speaking that I was hoping for <laughs> to see if we could see a slight muscle move or his his upper lip becoming less stiff <laughs> as he was listening to that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the, uh, the moment came and went. Uh, and uh, and so. I, I do think that this, the situation for Julian isn't, isn't good. I mean, he really doesn't have an, any of the uh, sympathy uh, in the uh, UK media. I mean, the UK media, even the sort of the liberal media, are still peddling the Sweden rape charges nonsense, saying, well, I don't want him extradited to the US. No, I want him extradited to Sweden. I mean, they're still peddling that line. Um, so there's no... Um, you know, the, 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 there doesn't seem to be any of the kind of um, uh, basic support that's uh, that's welling up from within the media. And I think that when the extradition uh, hearings uh, take place in a few months now, uh, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of um, uh, sympathy from the media. I mean, what, leave, leaving aside that, I, I, I don't even think that they're going to go very well for Julian, but the, the, the media won't be... Um, you know, screaming and shouting their support for him. Well, well we could see from the Assad, sorry, from the uh, CNN report that they're dredging up the 2016 election. And that has yes. nothing to do no. with this indictment. It'll have nothing to do with him standing trial in the U.S. if he's extradited. Uh, so it would be really interesting to see how they will, if he's extradited, how the mainstream media will cover that trial here in Alexandria, where I am. Because uh, well, I, if I they think start bringing... Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I think uh, that's a good question. But I think that's why this, the CNN brought up the 20, is bringing up the 2016 just in order to generate hostility uh, towards him. And, and, and to, to a certain extent, it, it worked. I mean, if you look at the Twitter after that CNN report, uh, everyone was again uh, saying, you know, repeating the, oh, what a swine Assange is, you know, Manafort, Assange, Roger Stone, the whole, the whole of that, you know, ridiculous kind of conspiracy made of thin air was being uh, rehashed. And I think that that's why CNN did it. It's just in order to generate hostility towards him. This is the person to hate. Why should we hate him? Because he brought us Donald Trump. Well, and as uh, George, and I think, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I was, 
I was going to say that as Joe went over with, with Kristen just a moment ago, the Espionage Act uh, indictment, the charges under the Espionage Act, do have such an impact potentially for the media that it seems like the type of impulse CNN was acting on, it looks like it's some sort of suicidal impulse to attack, attack Assange at this time. But I guess that they feel they feel solid enough in their position as a state stenographer that they feel it won't, they won't be applied to them. That's, that's exactly it. Because even if you look at those editorials in the New York Times and the Washington Post that did express some concern about that indictment, they still insisted Julian Assange is not a journalist. He is not a real journalist, not like, you know, what we are. You know, we are real journalists. He isn't a journalist. And that is will be a theme that will be repeated in the media coverage. And they're going to repeat exactly what the U.S. prosecutors will be saying. Julian Assange is not a journalist. He is not entitled to the protections of the uh, First Amendment. Um, and I think that, that will be say, so, yeah, go after him, but you're not going to come after us. Now, I think it's a ridiculous idea, but, but I think that's going to be the, the way they're going to rationalize it. That, um, you know, that's, um, I mean, you remember when WikiLeaks published those um, Podesta emails and Chris Cuomo said, it will be against the law for you to look at those <laughs> uh, emails. Not for me, I can, because I'm in, a member of the press and therefore the First Amendment uh, protects me. But for you, yeah, it doesn't apply to you. It's against the law for you to look at it. Meanwhile, they're and not I even think classified. That's the yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's going to be the, the the theme. You know, say, well, you know, he, he's not really one of us. He's not a real um, uh, journalist. And I think it's interesting that even the more sensible among the journalists, like somebody that um, the guy in the Washington Post, Philip Bump, who who has debunked some aspects of. Um, of Russiagate, particularly the, the issue of the Facebook ads and how much influence they had on the election. And he's been pretty good on that. He will still insist um, that about the Mueller timeline, that somehow um, that, that the fact that uh, June and Sanj said on June the 12th that he will, that he's, um, uh, in, he intends to publish something, the um, Hillary Clinton emails, he, he, you know, he will still say, no, 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 that's it. I go by what Mueller says that uh, it was, um, uh, Guccifer 2.0 and DC Leaks, who provided him with the information. And in fact, I, I, I had a sort of small uh, Twitter exchange with Bump, and he said, oh, well, yeah, yeah, he said this on June the 12th, but on June the 12th, you know, he wasn't really referring to the Podesta emails, he was just talking about the Hillary Clinton emails, so therefore, what he said on June the 12th has no bearing on what he released in July. I mean, it, it's... <laughs> completely absurd. He never said that I'm going to release Hillary Clinton's emails. He just said, I will be releasing Hillary Clinton related material. It was, it was the media who just simply spun this and saying, oh, he intends to release um, Hillary Clinton's emails. Uh, uh, George, thank you very much. We're joined Assad, uh, by Assad Abu Khalil from Modesto, California. Assad, can you hear us? I can hear you very well, in fact. Yes. Thank you. So welcome thank to you. this second edition, second episode of CN Live. We apologize we weren't able to have you on last week. That's okay. But we have you here now. We've just been talking mostly about WikiLeaks, an interview with Kristen Hafnson, the editor in chief of WikiLeaks. Right. But we're going to turn in a completely different direction now uh, the Middle East. It's one of the things we want to continuously cover here on CN Live. Right. So we're really pleased you're here. Uh, Assad is a professor of political science at California State University. He's Lebanese in origin. Uh, he is a leftist. I don't think it's, he'd be ashamed of me saying that. Uh, coming out of the great tradition of secular leftists in the Arab countries. So Assad has also contributed to Consortium News. Assad, I want to talk to you about Syria. I don't think there's been anywhere near the coverage of the Syrian war in the Western media as there was over the first six years, really. And you did a great job criticizing the Western media's uh, coverage of that war. So I wanted to ask you about why, first of all, you think we're not hearing much about it anymore. Could it be that Assad... Uh, is winning as Bashar al-Assad uh, and Russia and, uh, and Iran and Hezbollah are basically winning. Uh, and then I want to ask you about the Battle of Idlib province. I remember when Aleppo was liberated, when other uh, areas held by jihadists were liberated, they put jihadists, they being the Syrian Arab army, uh, Syrian government, put these jihadists on buses and their families, and they sent them to Idlib province. And right then and there, you knew at some point there would be a huge battle, the last battle, in Idlib, they seem to be concentrating them in Idlib. So 
uh, please give us your assessment of the Western media coverage recently of Syria and what do you think uh, 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 the Idlib situation is in terms of whether this is the last battle and how it's going? Uh, right. Uh, first, I want to say that there is a deliberate uh, disregard for the story about WikiLeaks in Arab media, most of which are under the control of the Saudi royal family. The Saudi royal family have been so embarrassed and humiliated by some of the leaks that they are more than happy to gloat over the plight of the founder. On the subject of Syria, I think you're right. Uh, there is not as much as coverage of the situation. And all those Western journalists who hypocritically and disingenuously shed all these crocodile tears over the plight of the Syrian people, they are nowhere to be seen. Just because the US government has not as publicly invested in the story as they did in the past. Uh, I am more critical of the Syrian government than you sound, Joe, but I will say the following. Uh, the Syrian government is on the one hand intent on extending its authority all over Syrian territory and resuming the oppressive rule that it had had for all these decades. And it seems the Syrian, government, the Syrian regime hasn't learned from the lessons of the past because they still censor TV shows, they still censor writings and so on. So they keep doing that role that they've always done. And on the other hand, uh, the Turkish government at the behest of uh, the United States, I think partly, is not allowing the Syrian government to take over Idlib. So there is a tug of war going on. And despite what the Russian calculations are, and I'm not sure what they are because they seem to play uh, a double game. On the one hand, they are supportive of the Syrian government and its allies, which include Hezbollah. But on the other hand, they work very closely with the Israelis, allowing Israel the freedom to bomb and to violate Syrian territory and Lebanese territory in the, mean, uh, in the, in the, in the course of bombing Syria as well. Uh, I think that the United States and the Western countries do not want the Syrian carnage to end. Let us remember that Western governments have a very long record of extending, prolonging the suffering of people who are going through civil wars or uh, wars between two countries. Western countries are behind the prolongation of the Iran-Iraq war for over eight years, killing over a million people. They were also behind the prolongation of the Lebanese civil war from 1975 until 1990. And I think they are doing the same game here in Syria. They are more than happy to watch their enemies, the enemies of Israel, as well as the enemy of the United States, being, dis being uh, distracted and being uh, diverted into this war. And they also uh, don't want either side to win. And that's what's happening. The Turkish government is now investing heavily in the situation. I also noticed two days ago for the first time, uh, the Gulf media, Saudi media in particular, have been celebrating a new development, which is the CIA, despite absence of any reference to that in American media, has resumed training for the so-called Free Senior Army, uh, as if their past record of uh, fighting in Syria has been any successful in the past, as if it's gonna make any difference now. But that tells me that the United States is intent on keeping the status quo as it is. They don't want the Syrian refugees to return, they want them to stay in the country, host countries, uh, Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon, because they want to use them as a bargaining chip. Because in the same time where the fighting is going on, there is the international envoy uh, on Syria, Anderson, who is negotiating a constitutional arrangement. And up to this point, there is no progress in that regard. The gap between the two sides is very wide. And the Saudi government is controlling entirely the Syrian negotiating team uh, the leader of which is somebody I knew in my graduate school days at Georgetown, and he was one of the most vulgar, vociferous propagandists for the Syrian government, and now he speaks on behalf of a new revolutionary Syria. I mean, it tells you about uh, the, the farce of the Syrian opposition exile that we refer to. So the Saudis control them, uh, and of course the Americans control the Saudis. So America is as detached as Trump seemed to be from Syria, uh, is intent on keeping things as they are without allowing any progress for the Syrian government to extend its control throughout the territory. So let me, uh, let me ask you, I want to ask you about what you said about the double, double game that Russia is playing. But before that, you mentioned about my position about Syria. It was interesting because I was reading you very closely on your blog, Arab, Angry Arab, and I agreed uh, with your position at the beginning of this war, the pox on both houses. Didn't like Assad, didn't like any of the opposition. Right. But when the jihadists began to grow in number and support from the Gulf countries, from Turkey, when ISIS developed and took over real territory there and uh, Al-Qaeda became a force, I 
suddenly thought, well, we had to choose between the greater two evils, either Assad or the jihadists. Who would you rather have? Now, Assad never, despite all of his rubbish over 40 years, including his father, uh, anti-Israel rhetoric, never posed a real threat to Israel. Right. And certainly did not pose a threat to Europe, whereas the jihadist is, is uh, Islamic State to credit for these attacks in Belgium and Germany and certainly the horrible thing in Paris, in California. So they were a threat to the West, uh, wh whoever was behind those attacks. Right. So uh, I came to the conclusion that we had to uh, hope for an Arab uh, government victory, Syrian Arab army victory, as much as I dislike the uh, regime of Assad. So what is your position today? Is there an alternative to right, a right. secular... Uh, corrupt government in Damascus of Assad or jihadists? Well, I mean, I have this argument, to be honest with you, with leftists in the Arab world uh, regularly. And this uh -huh. is a legitimate question to have. But you prefaced your introduction to me by referring to my leftist background and present, of course. Uh, I mean, I came of age when I was 15 and 16 when the Lebanese Civil War first broke out. And in the beginning, it was a secular fight between left-wing group and the Palestinian resistance movement against the phalanges and the right-wing coalition that were supported by Israel and the United States. And it was a glorious fight the first two years. And there was a potential for a real revolution. I mean, that's how I referred to it at the time. And that's how we did. And then in 1976, Syrian regime was assigned a sinister role by the United States and by Israel. And there's declassified US document to point all this out uh, in which the Syrian regime came to smash the revolutionary movement of the left in support of the right-wing coalition uh, of the Falange and the others and so on. So for me, I have still that bitter memory, not to mention the record of the Syrian regime inside against various groups. Plus, I mean, what is the alternative? I choose neither of these uh, situations, by the way. Uh, in particular, there was an alternative. There was, throughout the years, and I've known many of them, a vibrant left-wing communist movement inside Syria. And I'm not talking about these puppet communists that were controlled by the government and put in a charade as part of the regime and so on. I'm talking about real leftists who really suffered, people like communist action organization, who were the most brave, courageous dissident inside Syria. And they were rounded up uh, throughout the years by the Syrian government to this very day. Uh, the Syrian government prevented the real alternative that you and I would like, which is the left-wing secular groups and so on. So at this point, uh, I think we are left with a situation where the alternative are in prisons or they are dead. And we are watching a fight between uh, one side, the Syrian government and its allies, and the jihadis, who basically now are fighting on behalf, not even of jihad, on behalf of the Gulf regime, of the Western governments and so on. It's a very untoward coalition. I mean, the fight has become very much like that one in Afghanistan. Although in Afghanistan, I was very clear, I still am, categorically on the side of the Soviet army against all these fanatical groups that we are suffering from today. And of course, the United States and Saudi Arabia, the same group of today, they were on the side of bin Laden. I mean, look how history plays itself. Well, look, uh, you, uh, clearly, and people in the US do not know that because the mainstream media never tells them that for a long time, the United States and Britain have allied themselves, supported religious groups, extremist groups in the region uh, to overthrow secular socialist regimes or in name, if, if anything, uh, those who follow in the tradition of NASA to try to, uh, who were standing up to U.S., Israeli, and European interests in the Middle East. Now, when the Cold War ended, they moved on uh, their opportunity, I think, to take over these uh, and overthrow these secular governments. Now, could there be a revival of secularism in the region if Assad wins? I mean, as bad as he is. Could that mean spark? I, I, a spark right, I do not secular. see that at all. And I also uh, do not compare the Assad regime or the Saddam regime to Nasser. I mean, Nasser had right. a very progressive secular project, which had reverberation throughout the region. I mean, Nasser really championed the very poor of people. He used to go to factories, and he used to watch what fa workers ate. And one time he saw some of them eating onions and bread, and he was so astonished, and he had a change in public policy because he was so affected by the small nutritional intake by these workers. Nothing like that in the Basist regime. And in particular, the current president of Syria, since he took over, has championed neoliberal policies. I mean, up to the war, he was on very good terms with the United States, with the World Bank, with Western Lending Institution. There was a Four Seasons Hotel open. And this is an element of the underlying causes of the Syrian revolt. They, these were the displaced people from neoliberalism, the people who suffered, especially in rural areas, who left because of drought, came to the cities, and there were no jobs available to them. 
the ones who were benefiting were the rich elite, some of which were cronies of the regime themselves and relative of the president. Yes, that uh, Four Seasons uh, Hotel in Damascus I went to, that was a place where Wall Street uh, Wall Streeters were going on holiday just before the war began, up right, right. to the beginning. I didn't mean to imply in any way uh, to compare a Saddam or even Gaddafi, who they all claim to be inheritors right. of Nasser, right. as being anywhere like right. Nasser. But the argument I was trying to make was, right. what would an Assad victory mean in Syria to the explosion of extremist right. religious groups backed by the Gulf, the Trans U.S.? That's what I really want to ask you. Uh, to answer your question about secularism, I'm glad, like, uh, it just struck me, you're asking about leftism and secularism, how rarely these issues are discussed and associated in the Middle East. This mm. is an untold story in mainstream media, by the way, and I'm glad here we have a chance to talk about it. I think there is a chance for secularism and there is a chance for rise of leftism and so on. People are, so, I mean, the thing is, the crimes of Gulf governments and the crimes of these fanatical religious groups, many of which are supported by the West over the decades, have become so, uh, so widespread that people are uh, d disgusted, uh, not only with their ideologies, and some people are disgusted by religion in general. I feel there is, I mean, you can see that on social media where people have a chance to express themselves. People are fed up with religious movement and so on. And uh, so there is a possibility of pushing the religious establishment, which is widely mocked in social media, uh, away in the future. But unfortunately, it is resurrected by every regime. I mean, even the Ba'ath regime of Syria, it wasn't that it was against the exploitation of religion for its own purposes. It wants to exploit religion, but it's for its own end, not for the end of uh, you know, another government and so on. So it didn't push secularism as much. Uh, on, on the subject of uh, what's gonna come uh, next, I mean, my worry is the Syrian government, if it achieves victory, it will harbor an illusion that it can resume to, re to rule in the same manner it ruled in the past. And I say that, because I see signs, somebody was arrested because he wrote a comment on Facebook. And I'm thinking, this is, there is a war going on. There is an international war going on. There are all these array of international forces uh, led by the United States. And the regime had the time to, uh, to, 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 to worry about somebody writing a comment on Facebook. I mean, it just tells you that the regime hasn't changed its colors in terms of repression. The, the lousy Syrian regime, as you've often that's referred right. to when you were speaking now, I was thinking about the missed opportunity maybe in uh, in Egypt after the overthrow of Mubarak, when there were when the left when the secular so-called democratic groups couldn't get their act together to win that election, right. they right. they could not defeat the organization, the Muslim Brotherhood, busing people in, etc. So uh, I'm not too optimistic about uh, Assad winning again and that uh, creating a secular movement across. The region, but I wanted to bring back to what you said about uh, Russia's uh, diplomacy. It's very interesting. I've wondered about that double game as well. I mean, when the Turkish plane, Turkish shot down that Russian plane over what seemed to be Syrian airspace. I happened to be in Moscow that day. And then I could tell you one thing, Russian people didn't give a damn about it one way or the other that I spoke to. But it seemed like that uh, 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 how Putin would react to that would be telling in the long term outplay of the war. And it seems like he was able to maneuver Erdogan onto his side and get him to back off the support of ISIS, at least in Turkey, but not the Kurds. I think that's the sticking point. Correct me if I'm wrong. And as far as his uh, relations with Israel, I don't understand that myself. So could you help me to understand how what he's trying yeah. to do with Israel? No, I mean, I mean, Israel has the fortunate situation of having two big superpowers on its side. And I never trusted the Russian regime on the subject of Israel. I mean, I am somebody who never trusted the Soviet Union in the old days about the extent of its support for Arabs against Israel, because it was always pushing left-wing group that the Popular Front and the Palestinian resistance movement against radical solution to the Palestinian problem. I mean, in 1971, it forced George Habash of the Popular Front to expel his closest comrade, Wadi Haddad, because it wasn't interested in the international operation that Wadi Haddad was doing. So in, with Putin, I mean, uh, Trump himself said that in the first meeting he had with, uh, uh, with Putin, that Putin was going on uh, expressing rave uh, admiration for Netanyahu. And also I want to point out about the Russian people what he said that they didn't care. Public opinion surveys in Russia shows that there is the least support for Palestinians in Russia than there is for most countries of Europe or elsewhere. Support mm. for Israel in Russia. And I think also you, you probably are aware I mean, there is quite a bit of Islamophobia in, in Russia as well. Not as much as it exists in France and uh, say Austria and so on, but it exists nevertheless. 
uh, I think that the Russian government wants to achieve a foothold, wants to teach the US a lesson in Syria, but it doesn't go to the extent of in any way harming Israeli ability to control the region and to uh, impose its will. But thus far, I think the Iranian remain steadfast against pressure by the Russians to get out of Syria. And Hassan Nasrallah, in an interview he gave last Friday, was very clear that we have very good relation with the Russian government, but we have strong disagreements with them about what's happening in Syria, especially on the ability of Israel to mount all these strikes. One shouldn't forget that Stalin and the Soviet Union voted in 1948 for the resolution creating Israel. They support Israel right, right from the beginning. Elizabeth, can you ask, uh, a question about Iran, perhaps. Absolutely. Yes. I was going to ask, we, we know that Trump is infamously mercurial, but I was wondering if you feel that he will be able to uh, continue to resist Pompeo and Bolton and their push to start a catastrophic war in the Gulf, as, as he did resist them a few weeks ago. Well, I definitely believe that if Hillary Clinton had been president, we would have been at war maybe two years ago. Uh, I think Trump, uh, no matter what one thinks of him, represents an agenda domestically, as well as his own idiosyncrasies, have consistently been against military intervention in the Middle East in particular. It has to be said, he was much more vocal against the war in Iraq than many in the, in the Democratic Party, and even more than Bernie Sanders at the time early on. So I think that thus far he has proven to being able to impose its will in foreign policy. I mean, he went against his advisor with the meetings in, uh, with North Korean leader. Uh, he met. Uh, he went against his advisor in uh, meeting with uh, uh, Putin more than once. And I think on the subject of war in the Middle East, that's something he seems to be strong about. However, he is so ignorant of the Middle East and he's so ignorant of international affairs that sometimes he exaggerates his ability to play brinkmanship. And I think the Iranian has proven, especially in the last few months, to be quite uh, capable of pushing all the way in order to make it very clear that they are not going to accept the status quo and they're not going to be strangled economically without pushing back. And I think what they have done also to hit at the softest belly of the international uh, imperialist uh, power, and that is the clients of the United States and the Gulf region. And they have been very scared and terrified. And I find it very ironic that Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, which were the lobby of war as along with Israel in Washington, D.C., have now changed their tune. And I noticed that UAE since have been packing its bags from Yemen suddenly after very heavy and brutal involvement there because they are afraid and they know full well when the, shires are, when the fires are shot, it will hit them first. Absolutely. And that brings me to my second question, which was that uh, the Qatar emirs uh, offer to mediate between the U.S. and Iran seemed to go nowhere during the emirs' visit to Washington, D.C. last week. I wondered if that was your take on that visit and uh, what you think that might hold going forward. Well, I mean, again, I mean, it was such a uh, such an absurd scene to see Trump bragging that the Qatari government is paying for the upkeep of uh, American soldiers who are in Qatar. I mean, this is a show of what happened. The Qatari conflict, I mean, the Gulf conflict between Qatar on the one hand and UAE and Saudi Arabia on the other hand, has produced a competition between all these wealthy regimes to basically buy, uh, to, to buy approval and sympathy from the Trump administration. And that has resulted in the transfer of billions of dollars of people's money in those countries. And of course, the people are not allowed to speak for themselves over there. And uh, all that to keep Trump happy. And Trump is happy as long as they buy weapons and they accumulate them and they transfer their money to buy US treasury bonds and so on. And that's what's happening. Um, the other thing about mediation, I think that there are talks going on through the Omanis, through the Qataris, through the Japanese and so on. It is not what's happening in the surface. And I see many mixed messages. On Friday, Hassan Nasrallah said, there is categorically no talks gonna happen between Iran and the United States. Two days later, I heard a very different message from the foreign minister of Iran and from the president of Iran, Rouhani. Both of them said there can be talks with the United States under one condition or two, which is to lift the sanctions or to go back to the agreement and so on. So there is more room for uh, a possibility of talks than seems on the surface. Interesting. Now, that makes a lot of sense. Are there any hopes 
uh, for accommodation between the Saudis and Iranians, that which obviously would all. affect Yemen, Syria, uh, etc. I mean, the Saudi government really now is an appendage of the Israeli government. There is a very strong alliance between the triangle, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Israel. These are really, and of course, sponsored by the United States. These are the leaders of the Arab counter-revolution. They are the ones who smashed the revolutionary potential in Egypt, which Joe just alluded to. And they are now trying to do the same in Sudan. And in Sudan, the Communist Party, among some radical leftists, are warning about this counter-revolution. And for that, signing of the agreement with the military dictatorship has been delayed, despite pressure by Saudi Arabia, UAE, and the United States. Uh, Palestine also, you know, has a Palestinian Authority president, obviously Mahmoud Abbas, uh, and he's grown a spine. Uh, has he grown a spine? Sorry, during uh, in turning down the bribe from the U.S., otherwise known as Trump's deal of the century. Um, do you think he would, the Palestinians have ever let Abbas get uh, getting away with agreeing to that? Uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, is not capable of growing a spine, even if his life depended on it. Uh, what seemed to be defiance in the face of the Trump administration is nothing but acceptance of reality. This guy is so unpopular. He is so discredited and his corrupt regime and his family are so widely mocked and among the Palestinian Arab people that he realizes he doesn't have the ability to push any agreement, particularly one that goes against the minimum that Yasser Arafat championed throughout his life. It, it, is, it is partly his impotence and his weakness and it is not his principled stance against the Trump administration. Uh, when uh, I, I obviously heard that when I was in Ramallah last time uh, from cab drivers, and he's universally despised Abbas. There was a joke going around saying that the first words he spoke as a child was not mama, or papa, but negotiations. Right. So um, he'll be there till he dies. Is that right, Assad? Is there any way to dislodge him? Uh, assuming he will die, but uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, his life has been extended for too long, but uh, yeah, I mean, all, all indications are, are for that. And I think the Israelis are more attached to him than anybody else. I mean, they realize that he is the one keeping the Palestinian Authority afloat and they need it because despite all what we hear, the so-called security coordination, which is basically the establishment of a repressive regime over the Palestinians and the prevention of any resistance movement by them, is continued. It hasn't been interrupted despite yeah. all the hostility and the, and the wordage and the bombast. It has not been interrupted. So what happens now with the Trump deal of the century is going to go nowhere, correct? And we'll just uh, remain with the status quo? The I mean, continued, it, it, yeah. I mean, it has, it ha this is the only uh, Middle East uh, package deal that has failed before it was even announced. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, there is absolutely no chance of, 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 of it happening. I mean, I think it speaks to the arrogance and the conceit of Jared Kushner. This is somebody working with two individuals. The three of them never have any background in diplomacy or in Middle Eastern studies. The only thing that ties them to the Middle East is fanatic devotion to Israeli occupation. And they think that they can ram a solution against the Palestinians. I mean, it is so, I mean, how bad it has to be when even your Saudi client cannot support it. I mean, that's a sign of how far off what he proposed is from being accepted anywhere in the Arab world. I think for that reason, it will continue to be delayed. And I see it being delayed beyond the next term of Trump if he is reelected. And if there is another administration, it will be entirely forgotten, along with many other Middle East solutions that the U.S. proposed over the decades. And that's just fine for Netanyahu and Israel, isn't it? Because they like the status quo. They like the illusion that there's diplomacy, but they, not, real, not real diplomacy. They like the status quo, however, provided they can keep the Palestinian Authority afloat. In the case of a fall in the Palestinian Authority, which I think would be a welcome move uh, if it happens, especially if, uh, you know, when Mahmoud Abbas dies and so on, and they are not able to resurrect any alternative, when that happens, then Israel would be more worried about that. And I think Israel also would like to distract its neighbors with blo blood and carnage because to keep them away from it. That's why they would like to instigate conflict in Lebanon. And I see signs of that. They want to prolong the war in Syria. Israel has always invested. I mean, if you look at the history of the Middle East in my lifetime, I'm 59 years old, every civil war, every war in the Middle East, Israel has been a participant in it and always banking on the prolongation of that conflict. The Lebanese civil war, the Sudanese, uh, the Sudanese civil war, the Yemeni wars, this one and the one of the 1960s, the Northern rebellion by the Kurds, everything, 
I mean, I cannot think of one conflict in which Israel was not heavily invested on the side of prolonging and always on the side of the most right-wing, least progressive forces in the region. So that brings us back to what we said at the beginning. You don't see an early resolution to the Syrian war. Uh, Idlib province will, even if it falls to the Syrian army and the Russians, you say, you're saying they're trying to revive a free Syrian army to, uh, to, to cause trouble somewhere else. And the U.S. Right, troops the are not leaving that. Syria. Right. But the chance of reviving the free Syrian army is not viable at all. I mean, the record of that army has been farcical over the decades and so on. I mean, the only group that is effectively uh, present in Idlib now are really the Al-Qaeda. I mean, that's what we should call them. I mean, they keep rebranding themselves right. and the regime and the Western media fall for it on purpose because they want to hide to the American reader the true reality of these groups. This is Al-Qaeda in Syria. And this is a group that the Obama administration has been quite fond of. And Ben Rhodes, who was advisor of, uh, to Obama on the Middle East, in fact, admits in his book that he's championed not classifying Al-Qaeda in Syria. Al-Qaeda, the group that was behind September 11, he did not want it to be branded as a terrorist group. Assad Abu Khalil joined us from Modesto, California. He's a professor at California State University. And we were talking uh, generally about the region and all of its many crises. And I thank you again, Assad, for coming on thank CN Live. And I hope you join us again soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye bye now. Bye. We're going to move now to a totally different subject uh, WikiLeaks and uh, what we talked about earlier. And we're bringing in Michael Isakoff. He's a journalist for Yahoo News. And he has just published uh, a series on uh, conspiracy theories. And he looked at the Seth Rich murder. But we need to get, yes, he is. Michael is now with us. Can you hear us, Michael? I can hear you fine. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. And I really appreciate you coming on to sure CN Live to talk about your series, Conspiracy Land. I, I want to ask you to start you off. Why? Uh, what gave you the idea? to do that series, particularly Seth Rich. Uh, I haven't been hearing much. I understand yeah. that it's the third anniversary of his death last Saturday. So that was the news hook. Well, this is but a there hasn't been a lot of talk about that. Yeah, it's a six it? part podcast series uh, called Conspiracy Land. And it interests me as sort of a, a, a test case, microcosm as it were, of um, how conspiracy theories are spawned and get traction and move from uh, sort of obscure websites uh, into um, the political discourse. And um, the, the Seth Rich case uh, is, you know, has almost all the elements that we see um, in terms of how these conspiracy theories get traction and get so much attention these days. Right. Uh, so there's a bit, a bit of good reporting in this. For example, uh, I kept reading that Seth Rich was a Bernie Sanders supporter, but I never understood where that came from. Yeah, you actually I mean, talked to one of his friends this, who said he wasn't. Yeah. He wasn't a Bernie supporter. Yeah. No, there's not a scrap of evidence that he was a Bernie Sanders supporter. None of the friends, none of the associates uh, we've talked to uh, had ever heard him express uh, support for Bernie Sanders. Nobody who has, I mean, and this sort of, you know, the idea that he was, has, was repeated time and time again. Nobody was able to ever cite any evidence, any Facebook postings, any emails he sent that backed up the claim, which was central to the idea that he was the disgruntled insider who leaked the uh, DNC emails to. Wikipedia. Right. Right. So uh, the central contention of your story is that this theory, this conspiracy theory that that Seth Rich stole the emails from the DNC, transmitted them somehow to WikiLeaks, and then was punished with assassination, uh, originated with Russia. And you quote as your source, uh, Deborah Sines, who was a former assistant US attorney, who was in charge of the Rich case until she retired last year. You say that she had a security clearance, and through that she was able to get access to two Russian intelligence documents from the Foreign Intelligence Agency of Russia, I'm curious to know whether you were able to, you don't have a link to them in your story. Were you able to view these documents? No, I, I have not, I've not been able to do, uh, I've not been able to actually see them. Um, it came from the U.S. intelligence community, but she was very specific about what she 
which she got access to, uh, what she saw, and then followed that up with a memo she wrote to the National Security Division of the Justice Department and a briefing she gave to Robert Mueller's prosecutor. She briefed, she briefed Mueller as well. So these are still classified documents that one would need a, a clearance to look at, and you, didn't, you don't have that clearly, right? Correct. Now, the, does, were they translated to English? Does she know Russian? Was she able to read them herself? I think she read an English translation of them. And she was able to read parts of it to you that uh, were enough no, to she convince she did not. You? She's retired, so she did not have them in front of her. But okay. she remembered them with great specificity. And what was striking to me is the first one, um, she identified the date. July 13th, which is three days after Seth Rich is killed. And on that same day, um, this obscure website, whatdoesitmean.com, publishes a story <laughs> with those exact same details, citing Russian intelligence as its source. Now, when you look at this website, you'll see it frequently publishes um, material from Russian intelligence agencies, Russian foreign ministry officials, Russian press reports. It appears to be very much a vehicle for Kremlin propaganda. Well, I wanted to ask you about that site, because actually, I've, uh, I think I've seen it in the past. It has got to be one of the most bizarre websites out there and there's a Absolutely. lot of crazy stuff out there right. it's kind of on the line of what the inquiry you know on the supermarket checkout line the children maybe with three heads kind of thing and it often uh, refers back to this srv russian foreign intelligence but when you link when you click on a link there it just goes to the english language page of that russian intelligence agency and right. doesn't give any support for what it says right, right. like the, the story it has now is epstein was involved with comey and nuclear weapons i mean it's really off the wall stuff so it doesn't link to the intelligence agencies. Don't you think that a sophisticated operation like Russian intelligence if in their disinformation campaigns would come up with something better than a site like that? To push you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't know. But if your um, purpose is to sort of get something into the social media bloodstream, um, to get certain actors sort of riled up and speculating on it. Maybe you would do it that way. Um, uh, you know, we don't know. I think there's a lot more that it would be great to understand about all this. Um, but like I say, it was pretty striking that without any reference to what does it mean.com because Deborah signs did not seem to be familiar with that. She would, was able to cite, with great specificity, what she got from the U.S. intelligence community mm -hmm. about the SVR bulletin. Isn't it possible that the U.S. intelligence agency that came up with this document I saw this first on this crazy website? And that's it's making possible, an assumption that's as SRV. Out, but as you point out, there is no link to the SVR bulletin in that what does it mean com website. What Deborah Signs got was the actual bulletin. So what came out the same day as uh, they both appeared the same day, the yes. website. And so I'm saying it's possible that, is, that, that U.S. Our, intelligence, yeah. U.S. intelligence may be monitoring that site. They think it speaks for the SRV. They put out a report. She saw the report. Ultimately, we're taking her word for it. And ultimately, the intelligence agencies work for it, that Russia initiated this because there was you saw the Washington Post story that came out right after yours, right. which said that it was not don't blame the Russians, blame the Americans because he cited six. Tweet, tweets from Americans within hours, not three days after, within hours well, of murder. You know, I, I looked at that article by Philip Bump, and, um, you know, look, he did cite, uh, when I looked at it, you know, a couple of, um, you know, very obscure uh, postings on uh, Reddit or um, uh, 4chan. Uh, there was also a heat. Um, some, some of those tweets were about an article that a now defunct publication run by Rupert Murdoch uh, had published on July 12th. Um, I think the the news organization was at that point was called heat.com. I believe it's now been taken down. Um, but um, they did not promote the idea. The heat street article did not promote the idea that Seth Rich was murdered by the Clintons. It simply cited, a, you know, various alt-right actors who were asking questions. Could there right. be some link here? What was distinctive about the SVR bulletin that is reflected in that what does it mean.com story is it was asserting as fact 
this is what happened, which is very different than the handful of um, of postings. Okay, okay, but the idea was site. the idea was out there before this web this crazy website said that, and we have no evidence that they that the Russian intelligence started this. It could have just been on this crazy website. So I want to just bring up. Um, but you know, but to be fair yeah. uh, uh, to our reporting, it didn't stop there because you know, as this goes on, it's very clear the Russians, Russian intelligence agencies, Russian um, operatives are promoting this idea. You have RT and Sputnik um, seizing on every sort of pseudo development about Seth Rich and playing it up to the, um, uh, playing it up as much as they can. And then you have the Internet Research Agency, which is the entity that uh, has been identified as um, uh, doing all the social media manipulation during the campaign, tweeting and retweeting um, on its social media platforms continuously about Seth Rich. I think we counted more than 2,000 times. Okay, well, I mean, we could talk about IRA for a moment that they spent about $100,000 on uh, ads, half of which were after the election and the ones before. Some were pro-Clinton, some were pro-Trump. It seems like not a huge influence, but let's leave that for the side for a second. You say, uh, you know, Julian Assange said that uh, he did he said it and he didn't say it, that Rich had something to do with this when he yeah, put uh, out that know, idea. So what do you Assange make of that? I mean, he played a big role in fanning this. There's no question. On August 9th, um, he uh, gives that interview to a Dutch TV reporter who we interview in the podcast. We cite the interview uh, in which he just throws it out there and suggests that his source may have been Seth Rich. He posts WikiLeaks announces a $20,000 reward for information about Seth Rich's killers. When asked why he's doing this, he says, we have to protect our sources. Our sources take great risks. Um, you know, it was all nonsense. Uh, there's not a scrap of evidence that uh, 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 Julian Assange or WikiLeaks ever had uh, gotten anything from Seth Rich or had any communications with Seth Rich. This was all made up stuff. But Julian Assange had a you know, vested interest in wanting to divert attention from the facts of where the real got source. The well, well, that, that might be possible, but uh, we do have, uh, and you also have in your story that the FBI says they never uh, got involved in the case and remained a local police case, correct. which we should tell our viewers has never been solved to this point yet. That's uh, but you do have this tape recording now of, Seth, of um, Ed Bartofsky, of course, with. Cy Hirsch, a yes. legendary investigative reporter. Yeah. Now, Cy did not, uh, told me that uh, he confirmed that's his voice, and he was angry that he was recorded without his knowledge. Right. That's and, all uh, he would tell I me. should that's point out in the next uh, episode of Conspiracy yeah. Land, which will go uh, live on Tuesday, uh, we uh, go into the hirsch Potowski uh, recording. Okay. You'll hear parts of it that you haven't heard before, uh, which will shed some light on this. All right. and, um, uh, and we also quote from an uh, email that Cy Hirsch sent to Ed Butowski after right. uh, that recording was uh, made public by Cassandra Fairbanks, uh, you, uh, in which he uh, completely disavowed everything that was on the recording. Well, he says, on the, you know, we'll wait for your next podcast. Maybe you can give us some preview here. He does say on the tape that he had a source in the FBI, that the FBI had the computer, and yes. that they, they saw that he'd asked money, Seth Rich had asked money from WikiLeaks in yes. return for these... He, yeah. And you, did, yes, Cy Hirsch did say that. And that yeah. was, um, you know, pretty uh, stunning piece of information. It certainly uh, got a, uh, a lot of people riled up. Uh, but it's worth noting, I mean, and as you probably know, if you've talked to Cy, that uh, he's never published a word of this. He doesn't have any corroboration. Well, I heard, I heard, I heard the and reason that he I disavows it. Well, I understand from a, a, a source who's deeply involved in this that he didn't pursue the story because his, the people he was talking to got burned when Batovsky published in that audio. And gave it because, well, it was some Butowski, months later sorry. that Batovsky published, that Batovsky. That, that, burned, that burned his sources. That's, that's what I understand. That's why I decided to pursue it. But we'll look forward to your thing. But now just to go to Batovsky for a moment. Oh, Batovsky. Batovsky. Yeah, Batowski. His story, as you well know, is that Ellen Ratner, now he's named her in a lawsuit. I'd heard about this before, but I didn't, uh, and I heard, heard her name, but it wasn't public. So we could discuss it now in this lawsuit that she saw Assange at the embassy, 
Somehow Assange asked her to pass this message on to Rich's parents. I don't, uh, Batovsky is a mutual fan, friend, uh, a friend of Ratner's. I don't know why she asked him and not did it herself, but he says Ratner asked her to pass this message on. And when he talked to, his, to Rich's parents, they told him, we know everything about it already. Just be quiet about it. So you must have heard that, uh, Michael, and you didn't include any of that. What, what do you oh, yes, we, we will. On, uh, on the next episode, we will go into all of that in great detail. And you will hear an interview with Ellen Ratner about you will. that during her okay. massage. All right. Well, we can't give you we can't jump ahead right now then. Right. Um, I'm turning it over to my co-host, Elizabeth Voss, for a few questions and then I'll, I'll end it. Yes. Okay, thank you for joining joining us uh, again. As as Dre said earlier, um, do you have any evidence, or do, you know, did you see any evidence that this website, uh, what does it mean com, actually made a, a significant impact on social media as opposed to other, um, you know, American sources and independent sources uh, from this website? Well, it was noticed. It was referenced. Um, actually, the first. Um, uh, Person to call my attention to it was a woman named Anna Merlin, who was uh, researching a book, a very good book on conspiracy theories. And um, she uh, flagged this as the first significant story to put out the Seth Rich conspiracy meme. Um, you know, how how many people read it, what their numbers were, I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, the fact that at least the... Um, federal prosecutor in charge of the case found this to be uh, alarming, or at least the initial Russian intelligence bulletin found it to be alarming. I thought this was weird. How, on a broader uh, you know, level uh, regarding Russiagate in general, uh, did, um, you don't cite any specific evidence that uh, Russia or the Russian um, intelligence services were the uh, source of WikiLeaks. And as Joe was just mentioning earlier, there is at least some um, indication that it was not a state-sponsored source. Um, do you um, do you plan to examine that? I mean, we've had a, a journalist like Aaron Mate of the Nation, uh, Mate of no. the Nation, state that he feels that Russia Gate in general is a conspiracy theory. Do you plan to cover that on your show? You know, look, um, I think the uh, U.S. intelligence and law enforcement uh, uh, agencies have been pretty definitive about this. Um, the uh, Mueller report is pretty definitive about this. Uh, what I find most compelling um, uh, are the um, emails that are cited in the Mueller indictment between Guccifer 2.0 and WikiLeaks. And what they clearly show is that WikiLeaks was soliciting the information from Guccifer 2.0. There's a number of emails that are cited in the, uh, in the days before the actual, um, the actual release, not release, but the actual um, email in which the archive of DNC emails is transferred to WikiLeaks, in which WikiLeaks is saying, what do you got? Do you have anything more material? We can do much more with this on July 6th. WikiLeaks says, if you have anything Hillary related, we want it in the next two weeks, preferable because before the DNC convention is approaching. And then on July 14th uh, is when the big uh, encrypted file is sent from Guccifer 2.0, which has been identified as a uh, uh, an online persona created by the Russian GRU, uh, the, uh, sends the email with that archive to WikiLeaks, which I should point out, by the way, is four days after Seth Rich has been killed. So the idea that Seth Rich could have been the source uh, is absurd. It's impossible. Well, and wait yet, a minute. Julian Assange threw it out there in that interview with the Dutch TV report. No, but, but Michael, he had clearly, said... That, and if you go to the Mueller report, he makes it clear that this was all a deliberate distraction. He, he had said on ITV in Britain in June that they already had Hillary Clinton emails that they were ready to publish, and they take weeks and months, whatever, to verify. I'm not sure how WikiLeaks does right. that. They don't just get something and put it out. So he had already said they had the emails. It was not they had, they, four well, days we after. We don't know. Hold on a second. We don't know what he was referring to at that point. But we do know 
that he is soliciting the TNC emails from Guccifer 2.0 in late June, early July. So if he already had it, why is he asking uh, Guccifer, please give us what you got. We can do much more with that. Well, so that's, that he, sort he, of undercuts your argument. Well, he had some and he wanted more, maybe. But under, underlying your argument is, for example, the law enforcement and uh, intelligence agents are certain of something. Well, you, they were certain on January 6, 2017, in their intelligence committee assessment, that Russia had colluded to turn the election. And now Mueller has come up with zero evidence of collusion. So they were wrong about that. They were misleading about that. We shouldn't, as reporters, we should not trust automatically what in law enforcement or intelligence people tell us. I, I, Joe, That's part I of our job, long, isn't it? I have a long history of challenging what U.S. intelligence and law enforcement agencies say. I wrote a book with David Korn, Hubris, about all the flaws in the intelligence uh, about the run-up to the Iraq war. So I have no hesitation about um, uh, challenging um, the agencies when they get it wrong, but I only do so when I have evidence that they, in fact, did get it wrong. In the run-up to the Iraq war, there were plenty of whistleblowers from the inside who had access to the intelligence who, were, who came forward to challenge what was being officially said by the U.S. government. There were dissents in the National Intelligence a a uh, Estimate uh, that was released in which the State Department and uh, various agencies of the Pentagon ch challenged aspects of the intelligence that went into the run-up in the war in Iraq. In this case, in this case, we're more than, you know, we're three years into this. There has not been a single um, whistleblower who had access to the intelligence who has come forward to challenge what oh. um, the U.S. <laughs> agencies have said. Not a single it. one. Not people like who have been gone for years who say, no, I don't think it's possible. It could have been done in another way. I'm talking about the people who have actually seen the right. intelligence. We don't that, is, that ought to give you some pause in um, automatically thinking that everybody in the U.S. intelligence community and everybody in the law enforcement community and Robert Mueller and his entire staff are lying. I never said books. that. I never said everybody. We don't need a whistleblower. We got Robert Mueller himself. He has debunked the, the ICA of January 6, 2017, that the Russia had colluded with the Trump campaign to throw the well, election. Oh, I, I think Mueller got, himself think, has refuted that Joe, collusion gotta, narrative. We don't to, need. You have and to that intelligence that. is just as bad and as dangerous as the leading up to the Iraq invasion in a way. Look, I bad accept, intelligence. I accept that there have been aspects of the Russiagate story that have been overblown by the media, that there have been a lot of stories that have floated false uh, allegations relating to it. But um, go back and read the intelligence community assessment. They don't deal with the issue of collusion, as you put it. They don't say that the Trump campaign was colluding with the Russians. That was an intelligence assessment about what the Russians were doing. And that is absolutely 100% supported by everything in Mueller's uh, report. So there's no contradiction between the intelligence community assessment of January 2017 and the actual contents of the Mueller report. Well, there's, there's no conclusive evidence that the GRU hacked that. Uh, that's an allegation in an indictment. It's now reported in corporate uh, established media as a fact. They never say alleged. Those guys will never show up in court, so we'll never know whether that's true or not. And that ICA report was taken as a foundation, along with the Steele dossier, which was, of course, opposition research paid for by the Democrats, purely opposition research, not an intelligence report. It wasn't vetted even by yes. Steele or his own agencies or anyone else, but it was portrayed as somehow being uh, intelligence and that that showed the facts of collusion. So the two of those together, and then the CrowdStrike, of course, analysis and not the FBI being allowed to look at the DNC computer, we are left with a lot of questions now and no evidence yet. First, the collusion has been debunked and there's still no firm evidence that this was a Russian hack and was not a leak by someone on the inside. And I'm not saying it was Seth Rich, I have no evidence for that. I'm not putting forward that theory at all. But you're basing your story on what a former prosecutor says that she saw a document you didn't see that you think was translated into English came out the same day, a very bizarre website that has no known real links to the SVR uh, intelligence agency. 
uh, reported something that could very well have been the source itself, just this crazy website. So um, I just don't know what the foundation is to say Russia started the Seth Rich uh, conspiracy theory. And if they promulgated it on RT and Sputnik, they RT and Sputnik are news outlets. You may not like their point of view. They're, they're, they're going to give you a Russian angle on the news, clearly. The way I think the ABC uh, and the US and the CNN is an American point of view and the BBC a British point of view. So surely they're going to they're going to be publishing those stories that they find interest uh, to them. Why do they find it interesting? Well, they want to get to the truth of what happened there. Now, obviously, if they were behind the hack, it would be in their interest to say Rich did it. Right. No, no question that there is a motive there. Clearly, well, that because was the, that was the conclusion of the Mueller investigation. Right. But I'm just saying that as far as real evidence, uh, you, you might know about the VIPs, the Veterans Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, who have done uh, forensic studies of the metadata of Jusifer 2.0. They claim it was a download to a hard drive inside the United States and not a transatlantic transfer, that that was not possible. And what do you make of the emails cited in the Mueller indictment? Well, he, he, has, he has text messages. There. He shows rather the file names, but he also says it could have been an intermediary as well. So I was a bit confused by that. If it was an intermediary, you know, they're quoted, you know, in the uh, in the indictment, and you know, it says Goose of WikiLeaks was reaching out to Goosefer 2.0. Um, how would they for this material? How and, would Assange or anyone, excuse me, WikiLeaks know who Goosefer 2.0 was? That's a, that's a, that's a that's another question, and I think that's you know, and a legitimate question to ask as to whether Assange in this case was a knowing conduit for the Russians or an unknowing conduit for the Russians. Um, Assange should, you know, if he didn't know, um, you know, the response that he might have given was, look, I don't know who this guy Guccifer was. All I know is I got the emails from him. No, he said it was not a state actor. So well, that could have been know? an intermediary. How on he the, know that? Well, because he, well, he knows who he knows who the source is. He may well, wanna, no, he knows he knows from who gave him one, the emails. What email? Yeah, he knows that Guccifer 2.0 sends him an archive on July 14th. Now, you know, does he know that Guccifer 2.0 is a uh, is a Russian state actor? He may, he may not. I don't know. Well, Mueller says that he did know, and he called him a liar in the report. No, now, I, don't how think, does, I don't think Mueller says that he knew the identity of uh, Guccifer. Well, he seems to say, uh, make him out to be a liar. And if it was an intermediary, it well, could he have did been... lie. He lied about Seth Rich. Well, you think so? We don't. We just well, don't know. Well, I mean, about you know, look, look at the interview, Joe. He gave an interview. He put it out there. He fueled it. Um, and which was really a baseless conspiracy theory that did incredible harm. I but what, mean, and the so essence of your, of your real people here, I understand, are, you know, very much hurt by all this. And that's, you know, that's a part of what we're exploring in this series, the, you know, the real life impact of some of these phony stories that get out there for political purposes. But the essence of your contention that it wasn't rich, it was that it was originated by Russia. Well, that I, it? Look, First of all, let's agree there's not a scrap of evidence that it was Seth Rich. This was all a phony story from the get-go. There's not, you know, nothing has tied Seth Rich to WikiLeaks, to those emails. There's just nothing out there. Well, um, that's right, except for Assange's okay. statements. So, there are no, uh, there is no right, evidence. But, right. but your contention that it was started by Russia, and it did have a clear motive, I agree with that, was these documents, but I'm saying that if, unless we we could see it and Russian speakers could read them, I'm not sure whether they. We, we, we'd all like to know more. We'd all like to know more. Well, you have to make a decision to publish at a certain point. You felt you had enough to I publish that story. Enough when the uh, when the responsible federal official in charge of the investigation tells me what she's seen and tells me what she believed the importance right. and significance of this was, and then when you put it together with everything else, we. Uh, were able to report about the Russian role in fanning the Seth Rich story. Um, you know, there is, a, it, it fills in the picture quite a bit. Elizabeth. Yeah, Michael, I'd like to ask you um, about to comment on the fact that, uh, you know, one of the earliest documents uh, leaked by Goose for Two or published by Goose for Two on his website um, was said to have uh, Russian fingerprints on it uh, in, in the metadata of that document. It was also said to have been hacked 
from the DNC, specifically by CrowdStrike executives in the Washington Post in the earliest days um, mm -hmm. of the Russiagate scandal. But it, what we find out later is that that specific document actually came from the Podesta emails. It was an attachment from a Podesta email that you can actually verify yourself by looking at the document on WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. So how is it that the DNC was hacked, and it was a but, but it was a Podesta email that was published? Well, we do know that the DNC was hacked, right? I mean, we do know that, that you know an archive of thousands of emails were published by WikiLeaks. Um, so there's no question that there was a uh, a hack of the DNC. Um, we also know from the indictments and the Mueller report that it was the same intelligence agency, GRU that also hacked the, um, uh, the Podesta emails and, uh, and swiped them. So it wouldn't be all that surprising that the online persona, the creation of the GRU, um, Guccifer 2.0, would um, publish some uh, Podesta emails as well as DNC emails. Actually, but what I'm actually asking, though, is that why would Sean Henry and why would CrowdStrike executives use a Podesta email attachment to say that the DNC had been hacked? That was their claim at the time. Yeah, I, I don't know, but I'm, I've relied in all my reporting on this on not what CrowdStrike said, but what on what U.S. intelligence and law enforcement agencies and the evidence that they've put forward um, have said. That's interesting because the the FBI, I understand, did not uh, actually view the DNC servers themselves. They were actually relying on a not only a uh, document from CrowdStrike, but a redacted draft document from CrowdStrike. To come to yeah, the I mean, I think if you can go back and uh, uh, you know look at how the FBI handled it, there's there you know probably are some questions as to whether they took all the necessary steps they should have. But I've talked to the FBI uh, agents and officials who worked on this, um, and you know they point to multiple pieces of evidence they had um, that gave them the comfort to say this was the Russians and not, and, uh, and not some other actor or entity. Fascinating. Well, thank you for joining us. Really yeah, one last thing, uh, Michael. You say mm -hmm. we know the emails were hacked. Well, we know they were stolen. That's for sure. There yeah. was a, cri a crime. Com there were crim a crime was committed, and that was the crime we know of. It yes. was a pri private property. They weren't classified, so it wasn't an uh, is issue of espionage, but they were stolen private property. Right. We don't still know whether it was a hack or a leak. I think this is the big question. That hasn't been proven either way. It's in the indictment of Mueller, but that will never be tested in court, unfortunately, because those guys are never, the GRU agents are never going to show up in the Alexandria mm. courtroom or anywhere else in the U.S. Right. So we don't know exactly how it happened. And uh, the... And, well, and it sounds like, you know, I'll, I'll take this as a little progress on your front that you're open to the idea that actually it was a hack and that the U.S. intelligence agencies got this 100 percent when they when oh, they yeah. said when they fingered the Russians that did it. And if you're open to that, that's fine. I mean, I'm, well, I'm open to anything when you show me evidence, but, you know, yes, I, I'm I, open I, because we all deal with the evidence we've got. And it seems to me that it's pretty strong. Um, uh, in terms of uh, identifying this as a Russian hack. You may not accept it because it hasn't been, you know, released in a court of law. But been proven you know, in, in a court of law. In the intelligence world, that's often the way, you know, things yeah, go. Yeah, well, well, it's not been proven in a court. Uh, well, an indictment, an indictment by court. law is not evidence. It's just an indictment. It's an accusation. Yes. So if proven. it's proven, yes, so I would accept that. Uh, I'd never accepted the collusion side of this story from the beginning, and that well, was that's a whole other set, uh, you know question, you know, which we can discuss at another. Uh, okay, well, but, thank you for joining us, Michael. Sure, I appreciate your time, and I'm looking forward to your report next week on. Uh, yes, next Tuesday. Uh, download okay. uh, the episode four of Conspiracy Land. And All right, we'll, fantastic. We'll learn a lot more. Thank I you so have, much have, again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, Elizabeth. Um, Mike, are you still with us? Uh, well, I'm, I don't mean to be, but I can leave <laughs> well, if you want. Go ahead, talk. I, yeah, you know, we're going to dissect you. What you have to say. I can hear what you're going to say about me now. Thank you. <laughs> well, we're going to move on to another story. We had an interview uh, earlier with Pepe Escobar, and we can have that rolling in a few minutes. And then after that, we're going to come back with George Samueli to talk about the entire contents of our program today in a new segment we're going to feature every week called By George, 
well, I, with George Samueli. Before we do go to break, I'd just like to say that I do hope that uh, Mike will consider uh, running Russiagate uh, in an episode of Conspiracy Land at some point. I think that would be fascinating. So thank you. Well, uh, he's gone now. Um, so we could just, uh, the, the issue I had with him is his reporting, I think, is not solid enough. I think I made that clear to him that this, the idea that Russia started this uh, is not proven by his reporting because of going to this crazy website and saying that that was the same day, the same date of the uh, so-called intelligence document that he himself never saw. Uh, and he, he thinks she saw an English translation of it. That wouldn't be good enough for me, frankly. Uh, and the fact is the intelligence agencies could be monitoring that crazy site and say, well, if that site said it, then that's Russian intelligence. And I find it hard to believe they would use, and he agreed with that, find it hard to believe that that would be a site the Russians would build to, <laughs> to distribute this information or misinformation. Well, it's similar to saying that, you know, uh, pointing out the fact that if Christopher II was a uh, Russian-based persona, it would be very um, unusual or reckless for them to uh, include a Russian Secret Service chief at, in name as, uh, you know, the name in right. their metadata of documents and that type of thing. So well, he did, he did say he was not trustworthy of uh, CrowdStrike, so we'll give him that. Definitely. Uh, let's continue this conversation with uh, George Samueli in the By George segment at the end of the program. And now... Abon, our technical director, could roll an interview we had with Pepe Escobar earlier in which he discusses in great depth the scandal that's been sweeping Brazil, an extraordinarily interesting interview we had with Pepe. So roll that as soon as you can, Abon. Uh, so joining us from Paris now is veteran Brazilian journalist Pepe Escobar. Pepe, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Enormous so, pleasure to be with you, Joe, and with all of you. Okay. So listen, Pepe, I know you've just returned from Italy, but before we talk about the situation there, I'd like to go over a little bit about Brazil. Since you are Brazilian, you've been following Brazilian politics carefully for a long time. And um, could you explain to us, uh, to the audience, some of the basics, because this has not made a lot of news in the corporate media in the U.S., uh, what has been going on there? Just what was the car wash investigation? Uh, what was Lula's role in that? And what is the scandal that The Intercept has revealed recently? And what do you know about that that is not known, uh, particularly about rumblings about Russia and involvement now? Exactly. They are trying to turn it into a Russia gate, in fact. It's uh, an extremely complex story. It's one of the most important stories of the early 21st century, because at the center of uh, Brazil gate at the moment, which uh, the uh, Bolsonaro government wants to turn into a Russia gate, uh, following <laughs> the master straight from uh, his master's voice. <laughs> it, uh, Brazil is a pawn in the big conflict, geopolitical conflict of the 21st century, which is the US against the Russia-China strategic partnership. We should never forget that Brazil is part of the BRICS. And when Lula was president in the previous decade, virtually every important decision in terms of expanding the reach and depth and influence of BRICS was because of Lula. He was extremely well regarded by Moscow and Beijing. At the time, we all remember, it was Hu Jintao uh, in Beijing, and uh, Putin was prime minister for many of those years, and Medvedev was president. And, and Lula was uh, admired, revered, uh, considered, and he was absolutely instrumental into many key decisions of the BRICS, including uh, this drive uh, towards the multipolar world based on bypassing the US dollar, on uh, the closer relations between BRICS countries, the founding of the BRICS Bank, which happened in 2014, uh, like two, two days after the, uh, uh, the end of the World Cup at the time that Brazil lost ignominiously. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and this was when Dilma Rousseff was president. So uh, BRICS, Brazil, Russia, China, uh, in terms of uh, the Beltway, it was always a very dirty word and very dirty concept, and it still is. So uh, uh, during the Obama administration, essentially, uh, what the, the deep state was aiming at is that we need to try to break up this relationship. Uh, it was pointless go, uh, trying to do something with India because India 
uh, the Indian establishment is uh, totally westernized. It's uh, anglophiliac, in fact. It's pro-American, essentially. They have, as much as I love India, don't, uh, please don't uh, misunderstand me, but their elites, they have a tremendous inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis the, the white man. Uh, there is, a, you know, some white man's burden uh, subplot is still going on in India, and uh, they, they still don't know how to relate to their colonial past. And they have a subcolonial mentality, many of their elites, in fact, including parts of academia, think tanks, etc. So uh, uh, it was identified by the deep state as early as 2010. And we learn all this via WikiLeaks, of course, once again, great work by Julian and everybody at WikiLeaks. That the NSA started spying on um, Petrobras, the Brazilian oil giant especially, uh, and uh, the Dilma government, essentially, including Dilma's uh, cell, smartphone, cell phones, you name it. And suddenly, uh, this NSA collected dossier falls into the lap of uh, a State Department asset, Judge Moro, which is from a southern state in Brazil. He had been to the US before. He was a big fan of the Money Politi operation in Italy, which he didn't exactly understand how it worked, in fact. In fact, many Italian judges of the Money Politi, uh, later on, they were saying, look, we saw that they were doing something for the benefit of Italy. In the end, we dismantled the political system. And what, what emerged afterwards? Berlusconi. So in Brazil, it's something much worse than Berlusconi that emerged, is Bolsonaro. It's, it, 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 there is an Italian connection, in fact. Uh, the family is from a small town in the Veneto, in fact. It, it's not mafia from Calabria or Sicily in the south, but it's a sort of clannish kind of, uh, uh, of association from, from the Veneto. There are a lot of uh, Veneto immigration, especially in Sao Paulo, which is a big Italian city, just like New York City or Buenos Aires. Sao Paulo is like a big Italian city uh, outside of Italy. So 2010 to 2014, it was the first part of, uh, uh, I, I define it as a rolling coup. And some of the best Brazilian analysts in academia also, they more or less tend to, to go along these lines. Uh, it was a, a slow moving coup that started with collecting data, which was the NSA role. Uh, the dossier lands uh, with a, a, a lesser, a minor judge in a lesser state in Brazil not in the centers of power and the, the center of economic power, especially Sao Paulo, they start what they call the car wash investigation, which is a carbon copy of the money politi operation in Italy. Uh, clean hands. I'm clean sorry? Money politi, clean hands. Yeah, clean hands, oh, yeah, of course, of course. And, uh, and this slowly evolved into, uh, I would say, a three-stage second part of the coup which was, uh, the first part was very easy to, to achieve. Basically impeach Dilma Rousseff on absolutely spurious charges. Uh, this happened in 2016. Uh, Dilma had been reelected in 2014 and the campaign to destabilize the Dilma II government had already started even before she was reelected in, uh, at the end of 2014. So, this went on for two years. Car wash was uh, progressing, of course, in terms of uh, plea bargains left and right, uh, and uh, uh, basically centered on Petrobras, the oil giant, but also the Brazilian construction companies, which are, let's say, national champions in terms of Brazilian industry. These are among the largest uh, civil engineering construction companies in the world with lots of business in uh, South America and in Africa, especially, and parts of the Middle East as well. So the first part of the coup uh, concluded in 2016 with the impeachment of Dilma. And the second part, what, which was the Holy Grail. So I tried to prevent Lula from running in the 2018 elections, which everyone in Brazil knew that he would win. And even the, the latest polls before he was actually prevented once again, 
spurious charges from running 2018, you would be elected in the first round, in fact. So uh, this was achieved, uh, I would say, in terms of international relations and a political economy, this should be the case history to be studied in the best universities in the world from now on. How do you organize a hybrid war mixed with a rolling coup uh, involving Congress, the judiciary, uh, Brazilian Supreme Court, uh, prosecutors from uh, many Brazilian states, and mainstream media, considering that mainstream media in Brazil is uh, as concentrated as in the US, for instance. Basically, in Brazil, it's uh, five or six families that control 90% of Brazilian media. Uh, I know some of these uh, very disgusting characters from the inside because I used to write for the newspapers 30, 30 something years ago. So uh, this, uh, so from 2016 to 2018, we had this machine, uh, congressional, judicial, mediatic, uh, business, etc., trying to frame Lula on any charge. And the only charge that Car Wash found was uh, a very dubious charge about an apartment that Lula might have received from one of the construction companies to facilitate some contracts with Petrobras. This was never conclusively proved. And uh, I'm sure this is something that you will never read in the New York Times and the Washington Post. As far as I could follow uh, uh, the American coverage, because my area is Eurasia, it's not Brazil, but I follow Brazil from a distance. But when it comes to BRICS and when it came to car wash involving uh, uh, a coup d'etat, in fact, a slow, slow motion coup d'etat in Brazil with Lula, I followed how the Americans were covering because the NSA was the origin of all that. And any well-informed Brazilian knows that, but certainly not the majority of the population because they don't have access to independent, uh, critical, critically independent media in Brazil. They are more or less brainwashed by the global uh, network empire, which would be a mix of uh, uh, CBS, uh, ABC, NBC, and CNN all together with a, uh, a telenovela, uh, heavy, heavy angle behind it. So most Brazilians, lower middle class or middle class or the working classes, they watch global and they get politics from what global is telling them, which is, of course, the Brazilian establishment and the Brazilian comprador elite's view of Brazil. So what happened to Lula last year before the election was absolutely critical because only a few months before the elections that everybody knew he was going to win, uh, he was sent to jail. This was obviously reported all over the world. And nowadays we know that along with Julian Assange, Lula is the most important political prisoner on the planet. It's Lula and Julian Assange. And it's exactly the same fight. The difference is while Lula was president, the deep state could not go against him because he was internationally respected even by Obama as the guy. After government is different and with Dilma, which was not as, uh, as much of an expert as Lula was in terms of political articulation and uh, not only internationally, Lula internationally was revered by everybody. And nationally, nobody could go against him because he was a master articulator. When you, when you, when you saw Lula in a room discussing with different uh, political leaders, it was an absolute joy to watch. No wonder professional politicians were in awe because nobody had that kind of power and, and charisma and information. And this is a guy that was practically semi-illiterate. He, he, he didn't even finish primary school to give an idea. And he could discuss with Hu Jintao or, or Lavrov or any, anybody all over the Bush, uh, Bush Jr. loved Lula <laughs> for, some, for some crazy reason. You know? <laughs> People in Wall Street loved Lula because you know, how he speaks his mind. You know, it's great to do business with him. And obviously for, for Wall Street, it was not a bad deal because they made a lot of money especially hot money in Brazil, when Lula was president, when Dilma was president as well, and now even more with Bolsonaro. Anyway, so uh, last year we reached 
let's say the conclusion of uh, ninety percent of the coup, which was Dilma in peach, uh, Lula in jail, and finally uh, because uh, the plan A, which was to have a social democrat as president of Brazil, somebody who belongs to the Cardoso, Clinton, Tony Blair, uh, neoliberal gang. And don't forget that Cardoso and Clinton are very, very close and always been. Uh, the problem is their candidate was polling around four or five percent before the elections. He would never be elected. So the Brazilian elites and everybody that was behind the rolling coup, the hybrid war coup, they identified, oh, our plan B is this guy, Bolsonaro. He's supported by the military. Uh, he, it didn't matter that he was a mediocre uh, parliamentarian, which in 27 years in Congress, he entered two bills, which is something com com completely crazy now. But uh, he had the confidence of the military because they thought that they could manipulate him. Big mistake. All right, we're, we're going to talk about this later. Because nowadays, he is trying to manipulate the, the military, even though our current vice president is a uh, four-star general. And now there's a conflict between the Bolsonaro gang and the military. So, but this is, this is later in our conversation. What I, what I, to wrap up our, our first question, the thing is, nowadays, not only the NSA and the US deep state accomplished uh, the utmost objective, which is to isolate Brazil from BRICS. Uh, and if you see what happened at, at the latest uh, BRICS meeting, the most important uh, meeting was uh, Xi Jinping, Putin, and Modi. They had a RIC meeting, and they had a pro forma BRICS meeting, uh, proving once again that Brazil had, at the moment, is completely isolated. And this is the view from Mo Moscow and Beijing at the moment. BRICS at the moment doesn't exist. It's RIC. If we need to convert someone to the future of Eurasian integration, it's Modi. And at the moment, Brazil with Bolsonaro is a Trumpian neo-colonial uh, entity. And that's what Brazil is nowadays. And uh, in fact, the latest, that, uh, the latest information uh, that ties up with all this, uh, it came out what, only a few days ago, Bolsonaro wants to have one of his sons as the Brazilian ambassador in the US. Do you know his qualifications, Joe? He fried hamburgers in Maine once. Well. <laughs> and I'm not making this up. <laughs> so this gives us an idea of how this uh, mini soprano gang took over. Uh, they, uh, they destroyed Brazilian foreign policy in six months, which is quite an achievement because Brazil always had an excellent diplomatic corps one of the best in the world, internationally recognized at the Itamaraty in Brasilia. They are destroying the environment with a minister of environment who's basically a, a guy planted by the agribusiness lobby. Uh, they are destroying education with a minister of education, which is anti-education. And this is even the, the best political scientists and, uh, and uh, the best of Brazilian academia, academia, people are so puzzled that, you know, some analysis are starting to emerge, but people are still puzzled. How could that happen? And so fast, considering that was this Mr. Brazilian democracy was very solid. It's, after all, it's a less than 30-year-old democracy. So, so it was not that solid. And it was very easy to dismantle it from the inside. So it was a combination of... Uh, the American initial impulse, uh, American connections, and the Brazilian comprador elite. So in only two years, you dismantle everything that happened with the Lula and Dilma government. Uh, the regression is uh, equivalent to throwing Brazil back to the 19th century, in fact, and I'm not exaggerating. Uh, in fact, the new, uh, uh, the, the way these uh, um, controlling elites view the emergence of the new middle class in Brazil and the working classes that are part of, uh, of the system because they, they are stakeholders as well, they are consumers, and before they were totally excluded. Because of the slavery heritage of Brazil, 
they they want to uh, all these conquests for for the past 15 years they have to be erased so the country has to be thrown into a position that it was in the 60s when there was the original military coup in 1964 which was to prevent what the president at the time the president at the time was trying to do what lula managed to do 30 something years later and this is what these people who they run the agribusiness uh, the families who control the media, including the, glo uh, the global empire, um, uh, the old landed aristocracy, especially in uh, parts of Brazil in the northeast and the central part of Brazil, the agribusiness lobby, and obviously the evangelicals, or what in Brazil it's called the BBB lobby, the Bible, beef, and uh, what's the other one? <laughs> Evangel ah, Bible, beef, and oh my God. Okay, it's, it's, the, it's the three Bs, just, just like you have, we have the four Bs that Zarif talks about in the run all the time. Yeah? <laughs> Bibi the Bin Zayed, <laughs> Bin Salman, and uh, well. And, and Bibi, Bibi Netanyahu, yeah, that's a Bibi. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, so if we have four Bs that want to destroy Iran, we have the three Bs which control Brazil, essentially, nowadays. And this leads us to what's going on now, which is Brazil now is a new colony. Uh, they accomplished everything that they wanted since 2010. But the thing is, what happens next, considering that now we have a new scandal that, thanks to the Intercept, is now, uh, uh, we, nobody knows exactly where this hack came from. Uh, and in fact, it was not a hack. Once again, and that's the similarity between Brazil Gate and uh, Russia Gate. This was a leak, but nobody lo knows who actually leaked it. It could have even been from inside car wash. That's one possibility. The other possibility was uh, uh, a war of clans among prosecutors involved with car wash. And the third possibility, which is the most sinister of, sinister of them all, is uh, this was a rearranging of the chessboard that the Americans imposed, in fact. And this is very possible because um, as far as we know for now, Judge Morrow is more or less arranging his way out of the picture. He knows that he will never be able to become the next president of Brazil, which is what he had in mind. So uh, he went to Washington uh, two weeks ago he talked to the FBI, he talked to the CIA. So uh, we are examining uh, or interpreting as a sort of, okay, he's gonna get his golden parachute, uh, transferring his family to the US, uh, children in American universities, uh, you know, uh, he's gonna go around uh, American universities talking about uh, the justice exper experiment he lived in Brazil, and that's it. Uh, uh, Pepe, let's let's back up a minute. Sergio Moro was the judge in the Lula case. Yes, and and he's now the, become the justice minister under Bolsonaro. And yes. some of his most right wing backers are turning. Even they are turning against him now. But tell us exactly what the Intercept found out and about his role in the corruption and the scandal involving the the con prosecution and conviction of Lula. Absolutely. What what these. Um uh, leaks reveal is is something that we all knew for the past two years, but we didn't have a smoking gun. And the smoking gun is basically the telegram uh, uh, intercepts, <laughs> literally, between Moro as uh, the judge conducting uh, this investigation and the main prosecutor of Carl Walsh, a guy called Delagnol. And we see clearly by their communications that Moro was leading the investigation, which is cool. This in, in the US would be, it, it, it's ground zero of uh, illegality, in fact. So he was the judge, the jury, the executioner, and the conductor of the whole policy, which is something absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? And of course, uh, mainstream media was reproducing everything without a single degree of criticism. The only criticism that you read would be at the, by the way, first class in international terms, uh, Brazilian blogosphere and independent media on the, on the net, which they were, they were detailing this from the beginning, but they, once again, they didn't have a smoking gun. 
So now that we have the smoking gun, because this is Brazil, nothing absolutely happened. Everybody was waiting. Okay, now that Moro has been unmasked and the top prosecutor of Car Wash has been unmasked, uh, things are going to start over. No, no way. The same thing. So Moro, Moro is saying, I'm not leaving. Uh, this guy, De La Nho, is also saying, oh, no, these are, they could have been easily manipulated, this uh, telegram uh, uh, communications, and this is probably part of a Russian plot. And that's where Russia Gate comes in. Because now the official version by the Bolsonaro and the extreme right camp, and also the Brazilian federal police, which is subordinated to Moro as minister, uh, as minister of Justice, is that this was a Russian plot involving Telegram and also with the participation of WikiLeaks. So, so it, it, it gets crazier by the day, in fact. And obviously, once again, with the, the cases with uh, Dilma and Lula, this is just innuendo. There's no smoking gun anywhere. Uh, Telegram even, <laughs> Telegram in fact actually uh, indirectly responded to all this saying, look, this is absolutely ridiculous. Our, we were never hacked by anybody. Uh, if anything happens, it, it was between, uh, uh, it was an interference inside Brazil by somebody. It was not in our system. Uh, uh, excuse me, Pepe, Telegram is like WhatsApp, is that right? It's is one that, of these, Telegram is yeah. like WhatsApp. It was founded in Russia, but uh, in fact they are anti-Kremlin. Uh, Pavel Durov, one of the brothers who found the Telegram, he lives in Dubai nowadays in exile. Uh, and uh, in fact, I was, I was trying to get them to, to, to talk to us uh, about these accusations. And we received uh, a communication by Telegram saying, look, we have absolutely nothing to do with this. We're not even in Russia. And it's true. They're not even a Russian company anymore. They're based in Germany. So, uh, but in terms of... Uh, uh, the Brazilian federal police and the military who, who are supporting this uh, theory, uh, the key point is to try to find a Russia gate angle because this is exactly what they have been told by his master's voice. Part, essential part of his master's voice is to create a rift between Russia and China and Brazil. It can be Russia against Brazil. It can be China against Brazil. China against Brazil is impossible because Brazil is number one. Uh, China's, China is number one uh, trade partner in Brazil. And they buy loads of stuff, especially in agribusiness, especially soya beans. Uh, so obviously, you cannot create a problem with China. And even the Brazilian generals, one of the vice presidents, for instance, went to China and uh, he, ha he met Xi Jinping. And obviously, he had to be extremely diplomatic. But with Russia, it's different. Because uh, uh, the relations between Brazil and Russia, they are not uh, as close in, in trade terms as Brazil and China. So this is the perfect scapegoat for the extreme right in Brazil and for the Brazilian military. Well, we call them the Haiti generation. Because these are the guys who were at the top when uh, Brazil was leading the UN mission in Haiti. I'm sure many of you will remember that period. So these guys are really hardcore. They pose as nationalists, as a sovereignists, in fact. But these people are, in fact, comprador, military comprador elites. And the best way to see the way they think, if you go to their official website, it's called um, defesa.net, defense.net in, in Portuguese. It's a carbon copy of the Naval War College in the US. And uh, they use the concept of hybrid war upside down, blaming Russia for hybrid war. And we all know the hybrid war is an American in think tank invented concept. We all know that. But it, some, sometimes they even translated some of my articles upside down. It's very, very funny. One of my readers told me, look, they are reading you at uh, the military, reading your stuff. But I'm not, I'm not sure they understand because everything that you say, they turn it upside down in terms of hybrid war, you know. So it's a very complex uh, a picture because we, we have so many interlocked interests that work together into organizing the coup, uh, making it happen, uh, making sure that the left in Brazil as a whole 
is criminalized, not only the Workers' Party, but, but, but the left in Brazil. So everyone in Brazil there is a leftist, whatever the political party you are affiliated to, uh, LGBT, uh, indigenous populations, uh, most, of, most of academia, and media, 90% of the media, you are a communist. So it's still Cold War mentality. It's very unrefined. Uh, in the US, these things can be more coded and more sophisticated. In Brazil, it's quite raw, in fact. You know. So uh, it's a demonization of every progressive sector of Brazilian society. Uh, starting with university. University in Brazil is being criminalized by these people, including the current Minister of Education. So uh, they accomplished the coup. So, but the, the, the second, let, let's say the, the epilogue of the coup is not defined yet because uh, they need to find a guilty party for this um, intercept uh, leaks. Uh, they have to blame somebody. They're trying very hard to find somebody who's linked to Russia or to WikiLeaks or both. And they have to solve a key problem, which is, uh, how long Bolsonaro is going to stay in power. And there is a rift between the Bolsonaro clan and the military. The military would like to govern by themselves. In fact, they are already governing, let's say by 60 or 70%, because the, the Brazilian equivalent of the National Security Council in the US, uh, which, they, which they call the, the cabinet of uh, institutional security, it's all Brazilian generals and with the same profile, the Haiti generation, and they pose as nationalists, but in fact, but in fact they want uh, China out, Russia out, and US in, which is obviously, as comprador military elites, they are following the orders from his master's voice. His master's so, voice being in Washington, D.C. Being Washington, <laughs> D.C., and the Beltway as a whole. Is Pepe, that... we're speaking with Pepe Escobar from Paris. Pepe is a veteran Brazilian journalist. He's also a contributor to Consortium News. And Elizabeth Voss, my co-host, has a question for you, Pepe. Absolutely. I love the comparison you've made between Russiagate and this car wash scandal. And I was wondering if you think that the outcome overall going forward will be similar uh, in terms of car wash to what we've seen with Russiagate, which is to say that we've seen Russiagate just continue to lumber on despite being debunked on multiple um, aspects of the scandal, whether it's hacking, collusion, et cetera. So do you think, unfortunately, that despite being factually kind of exposed, that car wash is just going to continue on regardless? Well, car wash as an investigation mechanism, process, rolling cool, whatever you want to call it, is dead yeah. by now. The problem is the guy who conducted car wash is the minister of justice. So he can resurrect car wash uh, on any vector he wants, as long as he's in power. And the number one prosecutor, he continues to tour around Brazil, giving speeches <laughs> here and there. You know, it's like nothing happened. They are to, their number one preoccupation at the moment is to find a culprit. Uh, after they find a culprit, we're going to see where this is going to lead. And obviously, this would, for anything to really change, uh, something would have to change at the very top, which means the Brazilian Supreme Court. Uh, they are in the recess at the moment. They'll be back in, uh, in August. And they're going to judge one of, I would say, thousands of appeals of Lula's defense, which they are now arguing. Considering what we all know now about car wash, everything was illegal including the imprisonment of Lula. So the whole story has to be declared null and void. We know this is not going to happen because uh, from the Supreme Court judges, I, we, we can say for sure that at least four of them are completely bought by the ruling comprador elite. And that will leave only, only two, a minority of two. So it's impossible at the moment to overturn uh, everything that happened. Uh, in the rolling hybrid war coup. But the pressure from civil society will be essential. But the problem is civil society, uh, when you talk about civil society nowadays, it does not include mainstream media and it does not include uh, major Brazilian business. They are still betting on Bolsonaro uh, privatizing everything in Brazil, number one, uh, basically selling Brazil out 
which is exactly what his master's voice, uh, Deep State uh, Beltway, want, uh, to the benefit especially of American companies, like uh, selling Embraer to Boeing. That's the number one example at the moment. And privatizing parts of the pre-salt uh, deposits, which is trillions of dollars of uh, unexplored oil, basically to ExxonMobil, Chevron, and not to, the, to Gazprom or, or to, to Chinese companies, you know. So uh, we are in the early stage of the epilogue, let's put it this way. So it could become a rolling mix of uh, Russia Gate and total chaos. At the moment, we are in a total chaos uh, stage because in six months, they managed to destroy basically all, all the progressive institutions in Brazilian society that were organized with a lot of struggle for the past 15 to 20 years. They destroyed the economy. They destroyed Brazilian industry. Uh, Brazil was, uh, before uh, the coup against Dilma, was on the way to become the fifth largest economy in the world. Now it's the eighth and probably it's going to run to tens and keep dropping. You know, they isolated Brazil politically, especially from Europe and obviously from Russia and China. The only ally that Brazil has is the Trump administration, which nowadays doesn't count for much, right? So uh, it's, it's an extremely complex, still an extremely complex, uh, unresolved story. And it all depends, I would say the number one factor is what the Brazilian military are going to do next. And nobody knows for sure, because uh, there is an internal struggle between uh, a wing that we can call really nationalist and sovereign, let's put it this way, and the majority which poses as nationalists, but they are in fact subordinated to Washington's interests. So depending on this internal struggle and how they're going to get rid of Bolsonaro via probably a white coup, which could happen in the next few weeks, months, or one or two years, because they're, everybody's gonna see that the economy in Brazil is still imploding and they need to get rid of him and his minister of uh, finance. Then we're going to have a better uh, perspective of what could happen before the next Brazilian elections, because people, in, progressives in Brazil are basically praying for the next election so they can get rid of Bolsonaro. But we could have a Trump 2 effect in Brazil as well. He could even be reelected if mainstream media and big businesses behind them. It's very hard to go against him if they control the narrative. The thing is that they are controlling the narrative, but barely. After this scandal, uh, the intercept scandal broke out, they lost control of the narrative and they are trying to rearrange themselves. So uh, this proves that uh, our, our main thesis, which is the, the Americans wanted to rejig the chessboard, it's what's really going on. Because the, for, for, for the Trump administration, Brazil was uh, more or less uh, is closed. We won. They are in our pockets, which is exactly what happened when Bolsonaro was um, elected. The problem is his administration is such a disaster that even business in the U.S. are starting to complain to Trump directly. And we got this from some of our good Washington and New York sources that, look, it's not good to do business in Brazil anymore. We saw that we'll go there and buy everything and nothing is happening. So you see, uh, there, there are so many... Uh, superimposed layers in the story. And that's what makes it so fascinating from a journalistic point of view, of course, and from the point of view of this uh, bigger confrontation, which is Brazil as a pawn. We have the Trump administration, the deep state on one side, and on Brazil, they are in agreement. This is very important, unlike the civil war in Washington, against Russia and China on the other side, because Brazil is part of the BRICS. Uh, Pepe. <clears throat> yes. You've just returned from Italy, and there's a bit about Russia going on there as well now. Tell us about it. Ah, but this is, this is fascinating, though, because <laughs> it's fascinating because uh, the time I was in it, I was in uh, Milano, Torino, and Genova, which are a mix of, uh, they are three business centers in different areas, and finance, industry, ports, etc. The talk in Genova is the Chinese are coming. They're going to buy a stake in the new port 
which is in the, in the outskirts of the, the, if you've been to Geneva, you know, there's the small port uh, right in front of the old downtown mm -hmm. and a gigantic port in the outskirts, which is going to be one of the terminals of the new Silk Roads. Mm -hmm. Very important. We're going to have Trieste, we're going, in, we're going to have Geneva, and we're going to have Venice as well. These, the, the Chinese are betting on these three Italian ports because they figure out that only having Pireus in Greece is not enough. So they, want, they are building a sort of, uh, 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 let's say, a non-hostile string of pearls connection from the South China Sea, Indian Ocean, the Middle East, and Southern Europe for global supply chains and the interconnection between the new Silk Roads in Asia with Europe. And Italy has joined the new Silk Roads, the Belt and Road Initiative. This was still three months ago when Xi Jinping visited Italy. And obviously there's the northern part, which includes the the new Silk Roads arriving in uh, Hamburg and Rotterdam, in the Ruhr Valley in Germany, essentially. So the Chinese are advancing in Europe via uh, Northern Europe and via the Mediterranean as well. So this was the big talk in, in Genova. The problem is Salvini, number two in government, uh, he's the deputy prime minister, minister of interior and deputy prime minister. He has an enormous problem with China. He's very close to Russia. And as close as a scandal that broke out a few days ago of uh, Russian financing of uh, his campaign. And this is a very, very murky story. Still beginning, right? So uh, uh, we have the five-star people who are pro-China and Salvini and the Lega people who are pro-Russian. So there is an internal, uh, the internal dynamics of the, the Italian government at the moment. It's, uh, there's a clash of interests. Uh, because Salvini is very close to Steve Bannon, and we all know what that means. China is going to destroy us all, right? So this is very interesting. When you go to Milan, the talk is about everybody wants to invest in Italy, not Europeans, of course, Russians and Chinese. They are, uh, Milano is going to be a hub uh, in terms of uh, finance, uh, in terms of exporting made in Italy to China and also to Russia as well. And Russians are going to invest in uh, China, uh, sorry, uh, Northern Italian companies and many of them based in Milan. So it's interesting because you see Russia and China being embraced in Italy in a way that you will never see here in France where I am, for instance, where both are seen with extreme diffidence by the French establishment, which obviously they, uh, Macron, wants to turn France into a startup. So what Macron has in mind for France is uh, a very American process, which will never work in France. France is very centralized, uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité. Okay, it, it still applies in many senses. They don't want uh, uh, privatization of, uh, of the railways. They don't want privatization of the post office in France, for instance. And these are all priorities for, for Macron. Italy, and of course, on top of all this, we have the banking crisis in Europe. We have most Italian banks, they are completely dead. They are, I would, I would say they are un millimetro, one millimeter away from bankruptcy. And now we have, which was something that started next, started now, in fact, exploded last week, the fact that Deutsche Bank now Everybody knows that Deutsche Bank is on the way to bankruptcy. And they transfer some of their best assets from Germany to BNP Paribas here in France because they are connected. So if Deutsche Bank collapses, BNP Paribas is going to collapse in France and the, Italian, the major Italian banks are going to collapse as well. So this is what they are not discussing in Brussels at the moment because they are very busy trying to get a new <laughs> leader of the European uh, Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, which is a uh, uh, Merkel protege. Instead of discussing the imminent financial crisis that could disrupt everything in the, Euro in the European Union. So this, this is a, a short window of hell awaiting us here in Europe, uh, Joe. <laughs>
Oh, Pepe, uh, this was a brilliant tour de force of yours to bring us from Brazil to Italy to China to Russia. Um, speaking of the BRICS. Oh, God. And uh, we want to thank you for joining us uh, from Paris. Thank you. On CN Live. And we hope you come back and talk to us again and update us in a week or two. How's that, Pepe? Absolutely. Look, I'll be in Asia. So the next one will be from Asia, and we can talk a lot about China and what China is doing all over Asia. That would be terrific. Thank you again, Pepe. Escobar you, from Pepe. Paris. Enormous pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, and we will be back in a moment. Yes, this is Joe Loria with Elizabeth Voss. We, we are on CN Live. This is our second episode. We've just had the interview with Pepe Escobar speaking about Brazilian and Italian politics and Pepe's usual grand sweep of geostrategic situation at the time. And that was really classic Pepe. I thought Assad uh, Abdul Khalil also was pretty good and even brilliant on the Middle East, which he knows an uh, enormous amount about. And he told us about his personal experiences, for example, that he was a teenager during the Lebanese Civil War and the, his bitterness towards um, the Syrian government was because they crushed the possibility of a real left-wing uprising. We are going to be joined by George Samueli. And George, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Welcome back. Thank you. And we are now entering our normal segment called By George. George Samueli, who's coming from By Budapest, George. is going to join us every week to round up the show and talk about the entire contents. And this is our open, free-flowing, informal discussion. Uh, viewers are still sticking around. You want to hear what we have to think about what we heard. So, George, we had, of course, first Kristen on the editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks. We then had Assad Abu Khalil talking about the Middle East. We had Michael Isakoff to talk about his articles, his series on Yahoo News. We had Isakoff to talk about Yahoo News article he did on Seth Rich case, and we ended it with Pepe Escobar. So, George, it's your segment. Where do you want well, to start? Uh, um, well, I think we could start with um, Assad's um, uh, segment because um, uh, while while you you were on the air, there have been quite a dramatic developments in the Persian Gulf, um, in which Iran has seized. Um, one or maybe even two um, UK oil tankers. So it's all um, developing in a rather interesting way with Trump's um, maximum pressure policy uh, leading to um, uh, a very serious uh, crisis. I mean, and this was always inevitable that this Iran would react um, uh, very uh, angrily and very belligerently to this uh, policy of maximum pressure and um, and the inability for it to um, do b do normal business in order for it to be able to feed its population by selling oil. So that's a kind of an interesting development. Yeah, um, yeah. I saw. I see. I saw that headline when we were uh, playing the Escobar right, right. Uh, tape. Right. We did. I did not know about it when I was talking to Assad. We would have asked him about, it, but he did right. uh, answer a question of uh, Elizabeth's about. Trump standing up to Pompeo and Bolton. Yeah, and this is the time to do it again. Assad clearly, raised a number of interesting questions. I think that he didn't quite answer, and maybe it's a very difficult question to answer. The, the issue that you raised with him about Russia's um, role uh, in Syria and why um, it continues to um, turn a blind eye to Israel's continuing attacks on. Um, uh, Syria, and I think it, you know, it's it's a mystery. I, I don't fully understand what's really behind this. I think there is a big um, uh, sentimental attachment, sentimental relationship between Russia and Israel. I mean, there are an awful lot of Russian Jews in um, Israel. Many of them are very. Um, closely uh, attached to Russia. They are very pro-Russian. I mean, the, the Jews who left the Soviet Union and went to um, Israel 
are very different from the Jews who left the Soviet Union and came to the United States. Those, the latter, are rabid Russophobes. They are the core of the new generation of neoconservatives. They're the sort of the Max Boots, um, the, uh, you know, all this, this, um, uh, uh, Dmitry Alperovich, yeah, one of the Julia, founders of Yoffe, Pro exactly. All, all, of that, all of that crowd, you know, they they're absolutely <laughs> insane in their hatred of Russia. The those who went to Israel are, are very pro-Russian. I mean, they really like Russia, and I think they they have a um, um, you know a, a real kind of um, a relationship to Russia. Netanyahu, I think, needs to keep in with those people. I mean, he needs their votes, and I think that explains why he is so. Um, favorably inclined towards um, Putin. I mean, you know, he, he goes there for all the time. I mean, they, they have these regular trips all the time. Um, and, I, you know, and I think that, you know, Putin, you know, feels very close to it. I think if it, because so, so much of uh, Israel's population is of Russian extraction. And I think that, that kind of you know, explains in a, in a kind of cultural way what's really behind this um, Russian-Israeli um, friendship. But nonetheless, it, it is interesting that, um, uh, that Putin has uh, has turned a blind eye. You know, no matter what Israel does, how many times Israel um, attacks uh, Syria um, uh, in, in ways that clearly help uh, Al Qaeda, Russia does nothing. I wonder and, if it's not that sorry that if Russia was planning to keep both sides on side. In other words, they don't want the Syrian government to. Uh, run away with this thing. They've made that clear at the very beginning. In fact, there was a statement, I think, by Lavrov or Putin or someone at the very beginning when Russia first intervened that uh, that Assad shouldn't think he's going to get back all of his territory. Do you remember that, George? Yes. And that yes. really upset Damascus, but they couldn't yes. say very much because they're dependent totally on Russian intervention yes. to, to have won. Yes. So maybe there's some of that as well. Israel no, I, no, I can agree. keep Syria yeah. honest, keep Syria honest in a way. Not that I right. agree. Uh, I'm trying to understand. Right. The Russian and I think yes. when, the fact that they were using all the, all this time they were using Idlib as a kind of dumping ground yes. for all of these jihadis. I mean, they had to have known that you keep dumping them here, they're just going to grow in strength. I mean, it's not going to be easy now to dislodge them, having moved them out. So it's like they they allowed uh, Assad to take over most of his country, um, but not Idlib. And there's no no evidence at all that the Russians are about to allow Assad to make, mount any kind of offensive against Idlib. I mean, but they, they are you know, bombing in Idlib. Russians have been. In, in I, a, I, yeah, but not, but no, not as part of any offensive. I mean, no, they're not. There is no push towards capturing Idlib. You, so you yet, think they're just trying to contain it? Because I always thought they were they concentra they concentrating, the, concentrating them there for the final battle. You're saying it's only a containment. It's containment, exactly. Whenever that's, um, that's they, they launch any kinds of attacks, particularly attacks against Russian positions or attack from Idlib, uh, or even uh, government positions, Syrian government positions are attacked from Idlib, then Russia retaliates and does some bombing. But they are not part of any um, uh, campaign to recapture Idlib. Well, that's uh, very interesting uh, that that's yeah. the case. That's very dangerous, too, to keep those people I, hanging I around, hanging I, around I, like that. Yeah. They could be but used the again by the Americans, by the Turks, by whatever. They could be there. Right. This is a chance I, I, to eliminate them if possible. But, you know, the number of civilian deaths that could be associated with that would be, could be very high as well. I mean, that, and that's it. I mean, that's, uh, but that was always inevitable once they use this as a kind of a dumping ground. Yeah. yeah. That it's going to be an awful, <laughs> awfully hard to get them out. Right. Uh, and the longer they stay and the longer they get, um, you know, armed day after day, the Turkey is obviously arming them. Turkey has done nothing to disarm them uh, at all, which they were supposed to do under um, uh, United Nations uh, resolution and under the, uh, under the agreement between um, uh, Russia and Turkey in um, September 2018. Turkey was supposed to disarm the, um, the jihadists there. Turkey hasn't done any of that. So... Russia's just sitting on its hands, and you know, obviously. Well, they sold them as four hundreds, and that really ticked off the U.S., which has uh, restricted uh, access to F-35s. I believe they announced that the day before yesterday. That's right. That's right. Uh, so you again, know, Russia has many fish to fry. So yeah. Turkey is a, an, an important ally. I think Russia obviously is very happy to see a rift between Turkey and NATO. Um, I think so. That's that whole um, uh, South. Turkey has a, a huge economic dependence on Russia as well. After the right. shoot down of that plane. 
there were no more tourists going there and they cut off uh, vegetable sales, I believe, from Turkey. Right. So right. that was uh, so they got Turkey a lot of leverage over Turkey. Putin does. Uh, one yeah, interesting exactly thing uh, Assad said <coughs> was the, about the before he started that the media in the Middle East controlled by Saudi Arabia has been anti uh, uh, Assange and has gone uh, been quiet about WikiLeaks pretty much. That leads us to our interview with Kristen Rathenson, the editor in chief of WikiLeaks. What was your general impression of our talk with him, George? Be honest. Yep. Yeah, no, I know it was very interesting. You know, he's, he's he's very interesting. I mean, he's a very understated person. I mean, he's not you know he's not flamboyant. Um, but um, what he was saying was um, you know very salient to the point. I thought um, he was a little um, you know an understanding. I think he's pessimistic about um, the outcome. I mean, he's going to be a a real mighty struggle to. Um, secure victory for Assange in the uh, UK courts. I think the UK courts will go against him. Um, I think he will be extradited to, to the US. And then, you know, who knows how the, how the US courts will go. I mean, you, you, never, you never can tell. Um, what about I, our discussion, George, about the identity of the source, whether it matters or not? Because that also relates to our talk with Isakov. Uh, one right. thing I didn't bring up with Isakov was, and I should have, which was, uh, okay, maybe the Russians did hack it and give it to WikiLeaks, and Assange didn't know. That's quite possible. So he said an intermediary gave it to him uh, was a non-state actor. Does it matter if it was Russia? I don't care, because right. the documents are true. We learned about Hillary Clinton. Very much right. like the video, uh, of the tape recording of the phone call between Victoria Nuland, the Undersecretary of State for European Affairs, and Jeffrey Piat, the then ambassador of the, of the U.S. to yes. Ukraine, in yes. which they're discussing a coup d'etat against the elected right. president of Ukraine. They're talking about yes. the M word. Everybody focused in the American, yes. in the U S media on the F word when she said F the yes. EU, but it was the M word midwife. Mm -hmm. How do we midwife right. these things? In other words, yes. how do we pull this coup off? Now that was probably Russian intelligence that taped them and released that yeah. on yes. YouTube. So what? So we well, learned yeah, America that, yes, was involved right. in a coup, right? That's right. That's right. And a very important uh, document. Um, again, the, the, the mainstream media didn't pay that much attention to it, except for the whole, as you say, the F word. I mean, that became the, so the, the entire story. Oh, look at this uh, language she uses. Um, but it, it was quite of extraordinary that this revelation didn't lead to any heads rolling. Um, Obama evidently was seemed quite satisfied with what she was doing. I mean, you, you, and you know, you would think, um, given his exit interviews. I mean, in, in his exit interviews, he was being you know playing the role of a sort of sage and saying, "Yeah, well, you know, for you for the Russians, Ukraine is a very big deal, and it's not quite the same as for us." Well, if that's something that you realize, why did you allow um, a Newland to run with this policy? You knew that this, uh, you know, midwifing a coup in uh, Kiev would be would be met with a huge, ferocious response from Russia. So why did you just allow her? Why didn't you take any measures against her that she when she was uh, essentially conducting this uh, reckless policy in Ukraine? Right and on so, the ground in the Maidan, handing out cookies exactly, to the protesters. Cookies, exactly, exactly. And so Obama had no problem with that, and and then, but then plays the role of the wise statesman in his exit interviews, particularly with. Um, that um, Jeffrey Goldberg, you know, about, well, you know, it's, it's really very, very foolish for America to start getting involved too heavily in Ukraine because Russia means, Ukraine means a lot more to Russia than it does to the United States. So, you know, again, easy to be wise after the event. You know, why, you know, so why, why did he bungle this? Why did he lead to essentially a disaster for Ukraine? I mean, what he did, I mean, I mean, Ukraine has lost Crimea and it's now pretty much lost Donbass as well. So, you know, his policy has ended in, uh, in catastrophe for uh, Ukraine. Elizabeth, what did you think of uh, our interview with Michael Isakoff? That was kind of the uh, contentious point of our show, I think. Well, yeah, I think that uh, one of the questions or one of the points I would have raised if I could uh, do the interview again would, would have been to say that, you know, one of the points he makes in his reporting is that, or the key, one of the points that he contends his, you know, kind of argument is that uh, the Russians were attempting to somehow deflect from their involvement by per percolating this, this cons quote, what he calls a conspiracy theory about Seth Rich. Uh, but that opens him up to the, the response that, well, you know, 
the entirety of Russiagate, whether it's, you know, his reporting specifically or just the narrative in general, was equally an attempt to deflect from the content of the DNC emails and later the Podesta emails. Uh, so I think that it, that was one of the things I would have I would have brought up if I could have uh, talked to him again. Right. That's a very that's a very good point. Um, and, and, and it <coughs> serves to <coughs> deflect attention from <coughs> the Democrats making a historic blunder in selecting the worst possible candidate as its uh, nominee, something everybody could have predicted that she would be an absolute fiasco as a presidential uh, nominee. They went, they nevertheless went with it, uh, convinced that Trump would be a pushover, and then they lost. And instead of, you know, looking to themselves and figuring out why they lost, they, you know, they essentially cooked up this whole, um, you know, Russia stole the election from us uh, narrative. So um, Absolutely. I thought that... I thought that Joe, I mean, you, Joe, I mean, both of you, Joe and Elizabeth, you both asked him a number of very um, insightful questions that I think he ducked. I think he didn't answer the questions you uh, raised. Uh, and, um, and ultimately, I mean, he kept saying how, well, well, of course, the Seth Rich, I mean, that's, of course, a ridiculous conspiracy and so on, because there's, you know, no evidence uh, for it. Okay, fine. But, as you know, you pointed out, Julian Assange kind of hinted at it. Julian Assange has a pretty good record on these things. He doesn't just talk off the top of his head. So if he was, if Isikoff wants to dismiss what uh, Julian Assange says, then you've got to point out to other things that he has said in the past that are ridiculous and uh, easily to be dismissed. So he can't do that. Um, and, um, and, the, and the same applies to um, the issue of the timeline. Um, you know, he, like, like Philip Bump, Kind of dismisses. Oh well, you know, we we don't know what he was referring to in the Ju June the twelfth um, uh, announcement. Well, um, it seems very strange for him to be shooting his mouth off on June the twelfth about documents that he didn't have, and then he has to then plead with Gusev for two point oh one month later. Oh, you know, according to this timeline. Oh, please, can you provide us with this material? I mean, it somewhat stretches credulity that uh, Julian Assange would do this. He would, he would be shooting off his mouth about emails. And then when he publishes the emails, he apparently doesn't publish the ones that he, was, he meant to publish. I mean, because according to Isikoff and others, he was supposed to be publishing Hillary Clinton's emails. And instead, he runs with the, uh, with the DNC emails, um, and which he didn't even have in his possession for one month uh, after his announcement. So it, it just doesn't, uh, you know, it, it makes no sense. Well, I mean, Gustavo 2.0 remains a mystery, I think, to a lot of people. I mean, Elizabeth knows more about that than I do. Um, who knows who the hell the guy was, uh, whether it was the Russians or not. And I, the fact, if Assange asked him for more, I don't see what's wrong with that. They want as right. much as they can get. Uh, and then the, what they released, Elizabeth Wright, is that Trump opposition research document, correct? Exactly. It doesn't exactly. make any sense. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, and as I, I mentioned uh, to Isikov while he was on air with us, that document, again, was an attachment to a Podesta email, but it was that specific document is the one that had the alleged Russian fingerprints on it. It was the specific document that CrowdStrike executives and mainstream journalists said was the product of a hack of the DNC. And it's a complete you know, bungling because it didn't come from the DNC. So it couldn't have been hacked from the DNC. So I think that that, that really, um, the fact that he didn't really answer about that, he kind of ducked that as well. I thought that was interesting. But I, what I think actually is most interesting about this whole issue, the fact that we're talking about it now, the fact, like, as you mentioned, you asked him about the timing, the fact that he brought this up, I think is evidence that, um, you know, as far as the DNC is concerned and, and journalists who basically have towed the DNC Russiagate narrative are concerned, they are not giving up Russiagate as their kind of main um, deflection from their own shortcomings going into 2020. I think they have not resolved their identity crisis going into 2020. And I think that that's a really um, concerning uh, point as we go forward. So. Yeah, so, about, yeah, about Isakov, I also, uh, when I asked him about this Russian intelligence document that the former prosecutor got a hold of because she had clearance, he, of course, has not seen it. That's... Problem number one. Number two, he says he thinks he kind of said he thinks it was translated into English because probably this uh, prosecutor doesn't know Russian. The reader never gets to see it. And then most interestingly, he posits that this crazy website, what does it mean dot com 
is a setup from the Russian intelligence. And in fact, uh, I and he also said it would, it would be odd for the Russians to use such a crazy site if they wanted to be to spread disinformation in the U.S., a site that talks about the SVR all the time, but never links back to anything related to them except their homepage in English, which is not zero, which means zero. And the fact that it came out the same day as the website could have proven that it was the intelligence agencies who I, th I think maybe, George, you know, this 80 percent, something like that, of what the CIA gets is from open source. Most of what intelligence right. agencies get is open source, not from covert means. So they're right. monitoring websites like that. They may have seen that and put out a report the same day. We'd have to see. Right. Uh, we'd have to find out when that was. They probably could never do this. When it was generated by the CIA, if it was the CIA, and when that thing was first posted, they may have seen that, wrote a report, thinking and spinning it in their own way that this is what the SVR was saying, probably knowing it was nonsense website. And then that winds up in a document that's shown to this prosecutor. And he never denied that that was a possibility, that this could have been written by the intelligence agency based on this thing. So it's a circular situation here. It was right. never from the Russians. Uh, and he admitted that. So that's when I made what I think is an important point was, as a reporter, you, make, you have to assess what you have and you have to decide, can I publish this story? Do I have right. enough to go out there and say Russia started this? And then we have the Washington Post story that he brushed aside, which said that there were at least six American tweets right. within hours of Rich's death saying that he was murdered first, leaking documents. Right. So I, I think right. we put a dent in Isikoff's argument. He probably wouldn't agree with us, right. but. Right. No, no, then that, that's right. And the whole thing of just relying on the word of this retired prosecutor. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I saw this uh, document um, and. And. Um, you know, the, the U.S. intelligence people, they, they let me see this document, which itself is very unlikely. She's just a prosecutor. They wouldn't just simply give her some uh, intercepts of the Russian intelligence, which is what it was. I mean, it was basically Russian intelligence communicating. Uh, and so they, they just give it to her because she has some kind of um, uh, uh, official security clearance. Come on. I mean, they just that, they just don't operate like that. Um, and I mean, in fact, the whole of that thing was very murky because as far as the, the rich case goes, this was always a local police matter. I never quite understood from what um, Isikov said. I mean, why was a federal prosecutor involved? I'll tell you. I have the answer to that, George. Okay. Washington, D.C. is the District of Columbia. It's a federal district. It is not a state. It does has a mayor, but it does not have a city prosecutor prosecutors. So even local crimes here are investigated by the attorney general for the District of Columbia. Uh, so that's th that's the reason why a, fed a so -called federal prosecute, they uh, investigate federal and local crimes. So that's legit. That's okay. why she's involved. But, but why was she preoccupied with um, trying to write a report about Russian disinformation. I, I mean, you know. Uh, well, the you're, article says you're that a, she, you're a prosecutor. I mean, you know, you, you what you do is you you either say there's a case to be prosecuted or there isn't a case to be prosecuted. Why is she so preoccupied? Well, with she this? says she says in the article that she was bombarded with these theories that it was an intelligence uh, that it was a, a hit for leaking the the emails to WikiLeaks. So she had to deal with this, and she went to intelligence agencies to see what they knew about this. This is what she says. And she had a security clearance, she claims, possible, and she was able to get this document. So she wanted to put to rest. She had to look up what she called this uh, BS that she was upset about, that she had to even deal with it. And she dealt with it by trying to get intelligence on it. And the Americans came up with this Russian document, which we have no idea whether it's made up by the CIA, whether it really is right, a Russian right. document. But it's, yeah, but it's I mean, that we have to sort of <laughs> then believe what she's saying, because yes. to me, it doesn't it doesn't. I, I, to me, it doesn't sound plausible. You're right. investigating a murder. You're investigating a murder. What, what the hell do you care what, what the social media is saying? I mean, I, I, you know, it doesn't make any sense. What, what bombarded? What, who cares what social media is saying? You know, your job is to go do the forensics, uh, find out what, what's going on, what the evidence is, where does it point, and that's it. I mean, you know, why is she so preoccupied with what the social media is saying? Well, you're making the right point about why he believed what she told him. And then I, when I challenged him on that, he went back and said, well, during the, we wrote a book about the Gulf War and there were whistleblowers and we challenged that. But that, that book was probably, I have to check, probably written after the war when everybody came out of the woodwork to say yes. that, uh, they were, you know, whereas, you know, I lost a job on a Canadian newspaper chain because I wasn't writing the articles they wanted, supporting the war. I was reporting what was going on at the UN Security Council, highlighting the German, French, Russian opposition to the invasion saying there was no WMD there 
And I got a call actually from the foreign editor of this chain telling me his son was a Marine and I had to support the war. And I said, well, sorry, that's not my job. And I was let go the day of the invasion. So the idea is that he was not challenging her. He bought it because it fit in. I didn't yeah. say this to him, but I think it fit in to his uh, position, which he'd taken that there was collusion, which he's, you know, I didn't hammer him on that. Uh, he's clearly was proven wrong about that. And now I think they're trying to resurrect and hold on to the idea that Russia interfered with the election. And I'm, I'm arguing even if they did hack those emails, even mm. if they did give it through an intermediary that Assange wouldn't know it was Russia, so he could plausibly say it was not a state actor, it was some guy. And uh, he doesn't know what it was. It doesn't matter because it doesn't matter who the source was, as Kristen uh, said as well, that Satan himself could give him the documents. If they're true, they're true. Right. You publish it. Right, right. Right. What did you make well, of that? No, no, I think that's right. Okay. I mean, but, but ultimately, although there's no evidence for the Seth Rich uh, theory that he was, the, he was the source, it's true. There's no evidence for it. Nonetheless, as theories go, I mean, it, it's at least as plausible as the, the one where the, the Russians stole the uh, emails and, and handed them to WikiLeaks. Um, there's not much, n not much evidence for that either. Well, so. there's an indictment. There's an indictment, there's an indictment with, what, with an, an argument. Indictment, as, as you said yourself, an indictment is nothing. I mean, it's just a series of accusations. I mean, right. any, anyone can accuse anyone of anything. That, that, wasn't, that, that, wasn't, that didn't satisfy Michael Edzikoff. And he also right. tried to say that I was saying everybody in the intelligence agencies lie all the time. I never said that. So you're trying to put words in my mouth. Well, well let's move on to Pepe Escobar, unless you had something else to add on Isikov. Pepe Escobar, I thought his... Analysis of the Brazilian case was really brilliant because he laid it all out from the beginning that it was part of this whole process of getting rid of Dilma and then preventing uh, Lula from coming back to power. Right. No, I think that's uh, that all of that was fascinating stuff. Um, I was kind of interested in, in um, his theory. Um, did I understand rightly that he, he thought that um, Bolsonaro is likely to be overthrown by the military, or did I misunderstand him? He was saying that he's having a problem with the military, and if you recall, when Bolsonaro first came to power, he was praising like the military coups of the past in Brazil and, and making people fear that they uh, that this is what this basically would be, even though he was elected. But uh, I, I have to watch it again with Pepe said, but he did say there were now tensions between the military. And Bolsonaro, because maybe he, they can't control him. He's a loose cannon. He's, he's a, right. He is a Trumpian figure. So the right. establishment, the military, is maybe not pleased with everything he's been saying. That's what I think Pepe was saying. Right. That's, I thought that that's what he was saying as well. Um, and he was predicting that this would, this would happen pretty soon. So I was kind of surprised by that because he thought it would happen really in the next few months, you know, maybe in the next year or two. So I was surprised that, <laughs> that this is something that's uh, likely to happen in, in the near future. Um, well, we'll see. I, I didn't know his position was that, um, you know, that perilous. But from what he was saying, you know, the business interests are not happy with him. Um, you know, the civil society is not happy with him. So, uh, it, it, you know, this, this, that is and, quite interesting. And uh, his justice minister has now been seen right. in, these, in these releases by Intercept, by the Intercept, uh, to be corrupt and to have been colluded with the prosecutor to get Lula behind bars right. so he couldn't run. And he would have won, right. uh, probably, most right. likely. Uh, that's what the polls are showing. Yeah. But so, you know, mili military coups are, are, a, are a definite problem in Latin America. I mean, it's, uh, the OAS would be, a, would be in a very difficult situation. I mean, they may not like Bolsonaro, but um, any military coup, uh, <laughs> that would be a very negative response in Latin America. Who pays attention to the OAS? I'll tell you who the OAS pays attention to. Uh, that, that building, yeah, the two buildings at the other end of, near Constitution Avenue, where the OAS is located here in Washington. Right. Yeah, the Capitol right. and the White House. Right. That's and right. the Pentagon over here in Virginia. So and the CIA right. up in uh, further up in Virginia in Langley. So uh, if they want a coup there, if that it would happen with the American backing, clearly it wouldn't happen otherwise. Exactly, so, it would have to be spiked by the yeah. Americans. Yeah. Yeah. So if they're unhappy with Bolsonaro, uh, I don't have any indication of that, but Pepe knows what's going on there. Uh, then, you know, we could see that happening and, and it would be okay. We've got, again, we've got uh, Bolton, we've got Pompeo in there. These are people right out of the first Cold War during the whole period of those first wave of Latin American military right. dictatorships yeah, 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 yeah. that took across, across right. the entire continent for decades. So, Right. But I wonder what, um, 
what Bolton and Pompeo actually think about Bolsonaro. Um, Trump seems to like him. I mean, he sees him as a kind of a, a kindred figure. I wonder yeah. what Bolton and Pompeo think of it. Well, I guess it's be interesting. I mean, it, they probably listen to what business interests tell them. So if they say this guy is terrible for business, you know, they may say, hey, well, you know, we need to let him go. You do recall the first place when he stepped off the plane from Sao Paulo here in Washington, first place Bolsonaro went when he visited was the CIA headquarters, <laughs> which raised a lot of questions about it that did, was un it. unusual. It could be <laughs> a stop. It could be a stop on the way. You know, he goes to see members of Congress, obviously right. goes to the White House, State Department. And then he also happens to sneak in a visit of the CIA. But he went straight there as if he were <laughs> summoned, as if he was summoned there. <laughs> so maybe he's ticking them off. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't ask Pepe about yeah. that. That would have been a good question, actually. Right, ask right. him uh, what did he made of that CIA visit as the first stop. Yeah, that was uh, <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was a very that was just uh, very weird. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, George, <laughs> uh, if you have anything else to add, and Elizabeth, otherwise we could wrap up the show. This is our first by George segment mm -hmm. in which we just uh, chat in an open an open panel here about the. Uh, what we'd heard on our show, which was, uh, I think, an interesting show. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, no, I thought it was, um, uh, it was very interesting. Um, uh, I mean, Assad, I think, said a lot of um, uh, in interesting things. I thought that, to, uh, I thought it was maybe a little bit unfair to the uh, Assad family, the the rulers, of the Assad family. I thought that, you know, he was saying about that. Oh, they have a wholly negative. Um, influence in Lebanon. But, you know, I think that they were actually quite positive. I think that they were a stabilizing force in Lebanon. And well, after the yeah. war, but when they were invited in by the Arab League with the blessing of the U.S. and France, they were brought in there. But he was talking about during the war when he was a child, there was the a 19, real hope. Yeah, but it, in the 1970s, I mean, yeah. they were intervening really. At one time, they were trying to save the Palestinians. Another time, they were trying to save the Christians. Yeah, that's uh, the problem. I thought they were, the they were, you know, they were, I, I think they were a positive force in the sense that they were trying to um, maintain stability in Lebanon and make, yeah. make sure that no no, no community was uh, persecuted. No but, George, no, but George, that's exactly why he, he was against them, because of the stability they wanted meant crushing what he said was a possibly of a real left-wing revolution at that time, among especially Palestinian groups, and it was the Falangists, the Christians, who were the most regressive. They were the al allies of Israel, and then the Syrian government allied with them to crush this revolution. They don't want real socialist revolution. As he said, there was this... Right. That, well, that's, that's, that's the thing. But in, you so know, that's Lebanon the stability he didn't want. That's right. why he hates right. them so much today. He gave a personal reason right. for that. No, I, I th yeah, no, I think that's right. But you know, Lebanon is a, is so divided among all these various communities that the notion there's going to be a kind of a, a kind of a socialist movement that cuts across these sectarian lines. Yeah. I, I think no, that's, that's another question. Yeah, that's a whole. Now we may have to leave for another day. So yeah. Elizabeth, I want to thank you for being a great co-host and an excellent question you asked. By the way, I think I said that already. Of Isakov about uh, whether that crazy side had any social media impact at all or not and your insights on the goose for 2.2 are very valuable and, and and rare because not many people understand that yeah. and uh, we want to thank all of our guests including michael isakoff to come on i think he knew if he knows anything about consortium news that this was going to be uh, not an easy interview for him so i thank him for coming on and we're looking forward to his show next week about ed uh, butovsky and ed uh, butowski whatever he how he pronounces it Ed uh, uh, may be on our show as well to respond, uh, depending on what we see next week. We'll probably ask Ed on. And uh, we want to thank Assad and Pepe. And of course, Christian, Kristen, the editor in chief of WikiLeaks, for joining us on CN Live. See you Thanks. next Friday, 2 p.m. Yes. Eastern Daylight Time. Okay. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. bye. Get out your notebook.